The Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability is now in session. Good morning everyone and uh, welcome to this, the fourth day of uh, the uh, hearing that commenced on Monday this week, hearing number 17.2 of the uh, Royal Commission. Um, I uh, apologise for the lack of uh, the uh, uh, real-time um, videoing of the uh, proceedings yesterday. That was the result of uh, some difficulties we had uh, with staffing in consequence of uh, COVID-19. Uh, but uh, I'm very pleased to say that today the live stream will uh, resume and uh, we hope that we shall have business uh, as usual. We commence, as always, with uh, the acknowledgement of country, and I invite uh, Commissioner Mason to make the acknowledgement. Thank you, Chair. As a Ngāngāla and Karani woman, I wish to pay my respects and acknowledge the First Nations people on the land on which the Royal Commission is sitting today. We acknowledge the Mūwinina people, the traditional custodians of the land on which Ipaluna, the city of Hobart, is now located. We recognise the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, where the city of Melbourne is now situated. We recognise Megan, Brisbane. We recognise the country north and south of the Brisbane River as the home of both the Turrbal and Jagera nations, whose land is now where the city of Brisbane is located. We also wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all virtually appear from, and any First Nations peoples who are participating in this hearing, especially women, minmako, and children digital with disability. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Mason. Uh, Ms Eastman, I understand that there's a tender to uh, take place first up. Before that, is there another appearance uh, for any party given leave to appear? Uh, Chair, not that I'm aware of. All right, thank you. Can, I thought okay. I might make some opening remarks first and then uh, deal with the tenders after making some opening remarks. Very well. Pleases. So, yes. Commissioners, today you will continue to hear from women about their experiences with violence, abuse in their families, domestic settings and sexual violence. Up on the screen is the content warning. And as we've said each day, the evidence will cover matters that will be distressing and confronting. In fact, our first witness today, Libby Crawford, has asked us to have our tissues ready. In fact, this morning, our first witness uh, will be Libby Crawford, who lives in Adelaide, but she's traveled to Hobart today to give her evidence in person. Ms Crawford pre-recorded some evidence with me in September last year, and she will tell you about her life. Ms Crawford was born with some difficulties, including a double cleft palate and hair lip. As she grew older, she was diagnosed with an intellectual disability. Ms Crawford has experienced physical abuse as a child in her family. She was sexually abused when she was 12 and a resident at and Ms Crawford will tell you about her experiences of domestic and financial violence when she was married for some time and her life in a group home. After hearing from Ms Crawford, we'll then move to Brisbane. And again, we have pre-recorded some evidence with Nikki and Nikki's mother. Nikki was sexually assaulted at a respite day centre operated by Anglicare Southern Queensland. Nikki and her mum will tell you about what happened when Nikki and her father notified and Anglicare about the assault, reporting to the police and also Anglicare's response. We'll then take morning tea and after morning tea, you will hear from Caroline Cumming. She is the service manager, community aged and disability for Anglicare Southern Queensland. The Royal Commission has asked Anglicare about its response to when Nikki's father reported the sexual assault. 
Ms Cumming has provided a detailed statement together with providing copies of Anglicare's policies and procedures. And Ms Fraser will ask Ms Cumming some questions about the way in which <coughs> Anglicare responded to the assault on Nikki. After morning tea, oh sorry, after uh, Ms Cummings gives evidence, we'll take lunch. After lunch, we'll hear from a panel from WIDA. Ms Framada, who participated at the first part of the public hearing, will join the panel with Ms Hermans and Ms Moody. Ms Moody has been in the hearing room and following the proceedings during the course of the week. The panel from Women with Disability Australia, WIDA, will draw together the themes that the Royal Commission has heard in our hearing in October and also during the course of this week. We'll discuss a wide range of issues and uh, we want to understand from WIDA their proposals about changes and what needs to be done to the for the future. And then finally today, we'll hear from Katie Coolis. She's the founder and CEO of Yellow Ladybugs. Yellow Ladybugs is an autistic led non-government organization with strong bridges to the community. Yellow, Yellow Ladybugs is dedicated to the happiness, success and celebration of autistic girls and women. The Ladybugs are committed to being part of a growing conversation around specific challenges and support needs of autistic women and girls and individuals. And they actively seek to address many of the challenges the autistic community faces, including barriers to diagnosis, lack of inclusion in school and employment and access to support services. Ms. Coolis uh, will be joined by Nikita. Nikita is a member of Yellow Ladybugs and she will tell you about her experience of sexual abuse. And that will conclude today's proceedings. So Chair, the material that we need to tender into evidence arising from yesterday's hearing can I start first with the uh, evidence for Christy Hill? You have an audio recording and a transcript of the recording. Could those two items be identified as exhibit 17.20.1 and 17.20.2? Not sure we can hear you, Chair. Life continues to be complicated. Um, the audio recording and the transcript of the audio recording will be admitted into evidence and they will become exhibit 17.20.1 and 17.20.2. Next is the evidence for Brigitte. And there's a video recording for Brigitte and a transcript of the video recording. If those items can be marked exhibit 20, sorry, 17.24.1 and 17.24.2. Yes, the video recording and transcript of the video will be admitted into evidence and given the set of numbers to which Ms. Uh, Eastman has referred. Then uh, for Margaret Byrne, she provided a statement to the Royal Commission if that could be marked as exhibit 17.19.1. Ms. Byrne's statement will be admitted into evidence and given that exhibit number. And for Ali Robbins, uh, her statement uh, was provided uh, yesterday as part of the hearing, and if that could be marked 17.25.1. Yes, Ms. Robbins' statement uh, will also be admitted into evidence and given that designation. Thank you, Chair. Uh, give me a moment. I'm going to run around the back of the hearing room and I'm going to join Ms. Crawford now. Yes, thank you. So Chair, I hope um, you can see me now on the screen and we're joined in the hearing room with Ms. Elizabeth Crawford. And would you like to be Ms. Crawford or Libby today? Thank me. Libby, okay. so we're joined by Libby, thank you. Yes. So I'm going to, sorry, go ahead. 
Sorry, uh, Libby, if I may call you that, I want to thank you very much for coming all the way to Hobart to give your evidence today. We're very grateful to you for making that journey and being prepared uh, to share your experiences with us. I'm sure you've been introduced to the commissioners in the room, but I will just point out that in the hearing room with you in Hobart are Commissioners Bennett and uh, Commissioner Bennett and Commissioner Mason. Uh, Commissioner Gelbel is joining the hearing from Melbourne, and you will be able to see Commissioner Gelbel on the screen. And I am participating uh, in the hearing uh, from uh, Sydney, and hopefully you can see me on the screen as well. So thank you once again for coming to the Royal Commission and also for what you've already done uh, for the purposes of this hearing. And I will now ask Ms Eastman to ask you some questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So maybe we're going to start with uh, taking an oath. So I, you've got the Bible here with you, hand on the Bible. I'm going to read the oath to you. And at the end, please say yes or I do. Do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence that you will give to the Royal Commission will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Oh, well. Thank you. Well, Libby, welcome to the Royal Commission. Thank you. You live in Adelaide. Thank you. And you live in a group home in Adelaide. Yes. And you've recently moved into a new home, haven't yes. you? When we spoke to you last year, you were living in a home with three men yes. who didn't talk. And you were not very happy with no. that. And you had to go to hospital. Yeah. And while you were in hospital, you took the opportunity of advocating for yourself yeah. to say you did not want to go back to no. that group home. And so where are you living now? I'm living in Hawthorne East with another two what ladies who can talk and and one thing I last few while, which that's one my person. Can I ask you, so the two ladies who you now live with? Yeah. It sounds like a house full of craft. Yes. So tell me about the craft that you do. Uh, I see what you call, which I am a got here. I'm from... It pulls from an act, but it can pull from act. What does it look like? Difficult. What does it? What does the craft look like? Um, it comes with a key or comes with key, and you get covers. Yeah, and there's a lot of. Shitty and then and then then you for for a kind of um type on it so it can sick yeah and when you but uh, you look out where you want go yeah. you be type of and you've got this um, pin kind of thing, and you've got this big thing, and then you make sure you put pin in this big thing. Um, this thing is for make up the thing, one thing. Okay, so, so it sounds like it's quite tricky to put the pins in the different places yeah. and to work around. Thank you for telling us about that. Um, what is life in your current home like compared to before? Um, it's okay for now. Um, my, one of my friends and I was talking nice. Last night, I I feel is that I live on my own yeah. with with a a God. So that's your aim, isn't it? Yeah. You just want to live by yourself. Yeah. Choose your own house. Yeah. 
have the supports that you need yeah. and not feel that everybody's making the decisions yeah. for you. Okay. So can um, I ask you, when we t spoke um, last year and we talked about your life, we recorded that yeah. and everything you told me in that at that time was true, wasn't yes. it? Yes. So we might show the Royal Commissioners the recording that we did. Okay. And that was based on, just to introduce to everybody following, that was based on you had prepared some information for the Royal Commission. Yeah. Talking about your life. Yeah. And in the video we'll talk about, well, people can hear us talk about yeah. when you were a child and there were some problems with your mum. Yeah. And that was not a good time for you in no. terms of how she treated you. Then you moved uh, into a particular place, which was for children with disability in Adelaide. Yeah. And you lived there for a while. Yeah. And when you're about 12 there, you were sexually abused. Yes. Yeah. And you told your sister about that. Yes. Yeah. And I think we'll hear you say shortly that you weren't sure, your sister and I, you weren't sure should we tell mum and dad because yeah. they were a bit rocky at the time yes. as well. Yeah. Then as you grew up, you've lived in different places. Yes. And I think you say you're going to tell the Royal Commissioners that you fell into the wrong crowd for a while. Is yes. that right? And uh, that gave you some fairly good life experience in terms of dealing with different people mm. and sort of seeing a side of life that can be really hard. Yeah. And you've had a few boyfriends in your time. Yes. Yeah. And you, you did get married. Yes. Yeah. And I think you've got to tell us about what happened. He, oh, took, well. he took the wedding present and ran off with the money. Yes. Yeah. And then that, that marriage wasn't so good for you. No. And then you've moved into different places as yeah. well. And then after that, I might ask you some questions about the work that you're doing as an advocate. Okay. And you've become a very strong advocate in South Australia. Yeah. And the Royal Commission has seen, I think, one of your videos when we looked at the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Yeah. So our Voice SA uh, participated in that hearing, probably with some of your friends, Rach, yeah. Rachel. Yeah. And um, I'm going to ask you about being an advocate and what you think needs to change for women and girls. Okay. I know that for you, being able to tell the Royal Commission how important it is for women and girls to be treated with respect, mm. with dignity, that you are human beings, but you also, as women with disability, want to love and be loved and you want to have good relationships. Mm. So can we talk about that too? Yeah. All right. So let's watch the recording that, yeah. we, that we did together last yeah. year. Yeah. Okay. And get your tissues out, you said. <laughs> can I ask you some questions about your mum? Do you want to talk about her? Yeah. So she was diagnosed with bipolar and she didn't cope very well when you were little. Is that right? Yeah. yeah, and you, you remember yeah. that there were times when mum had to go to hospital. Yeah, and you remember that your mum sometimes abused you. Yeah, physically yeah, abused you when you were when you were, when she was unwell. Is that right? Yeah, quite a lot. Quite a lot. Yeah, and so when you think about when you were a little kid. You can yeah. remember being punched, kicked, yeah. and having your hair pulled. Yeah. And you understand because of this, you went to live. Yeah. And that was a school and a centre. Yeah. Do you want to talk about what you remember about living at school? Yeah. Um. What I mean by when I was real is how I was right by um my nun. Yeah. So on the home, and I told my sister. 
So you right. told you so you told your sister that you'd been raped by somebody at the center. Yeah. Yeah. And and um, we agree we keep it secret because mm. mum wasn't real. Yeah. And so when I was acting, I wasn't real at all. Right? And then I was helping with a lady kept with me in there. She was born. She took me born. And she had a fine dog. Right, so I was helping her. Then mum can pick me up. Mm -hmm. And then mum asked me about it. And so I was going to be angry with right? But she did good thing. And so who opened up and when dad come on from work, mom and dad come to my room. I had one thing, thing, mm. right? And so, so, um, so I'm saying to them, it's not my mom thing. Mm -hmm. It makes me think it. Right? And I told them who it was. So, yeah. can I just ask you? So, you told, so when you first spoke to your sister about mm -hmm. it, the two of you decided not to tell mum or dad because they were having a rocky time as oh, well. Yeah. So you and your sister kept that as a secret. You didn't yeah, tell anyone. More non um, But then I think either you or your sister told your mum a number of years later. Mm. And the people, as you say, from community welfare came. Yeah. And after you had that meeting with the welfare, what happened next? Did any action happen? Did any body take this matter further? No. Did did no, anyone no. offer did anyone offer to help you or support you in any way? Um let me think. Oh we to some um some Hospital. Yes. And there was some people there talk to me and the cross salmon. Mm -hmm. Um like that, I guess. But six things not like no one take it. Murder. No one took it further. No. But eventually you sort of ended up in a unit of your own and you lived yeah. by yourself. And I think you, you you say yourself, you got involved with the wrong people. Yeah. Now, what do you want to tell the Royal Commission, if anything, about this part, this time in your life when you got involved with the wrong people? What happened? Yeah. I didn't know it was one people, right? I so was urging in my head, right? And I hate you, right? And I came back from 
front when I had money in my purse, right? And then I had more friends, then I think it goes. And then that thing, and then it when it's experiencing in my house, mm. you hear it? And then he went in jail. He went in jail. Yeah. So it was, was in jail, but in weeks, my mom, right? So, then I don't know what's going on, right? Mm. And my landlord told me it has my name, mm. right? Then I say to him, you have my name, but well, somewhere else. Mm. But then I let it go, right? Then Someone told me um, that person believes, right? So I had to this many things to the end where I was remembering, mm. but I think she found when I picked her of big boyfriend, right? And I think that's him. That's him. Yeah. Uh, so Libby, uh, can can I ask you when when you had this relationship and this boyfriend? Yeah. Uh, what what experience had you had, or what did you know about being in a relationship and having a boyfriend? Do you not? Did you know? Well, how should the boyfriend treat me? Or what should what treatment should I say? That's not good enough. Or what what did you know about that? I didn't know what love is. You didn't know what love was. No, I I didn't know what relationship was. Um, I thought me thinking. Mm. Uh, like that. Did anybody teach you about consent as you were growing up and understanding what consent to having a sexual relationship would be? Um, um, as I was growing up, my sister had talked to me. When sister? I was coming back, mm. uh, and like being so much in this motion, what in a big motion said, no. So I think, and yeah. And when you were grow growing up and during this difficult time, did you want to have boyfriends? Um, I want the one I'm like. Yeah. Mom, in my friend. Yeah. And did you, did you think about what sort of, if you want, if you had boyfriends, what type of boyfriends you liked and what, how you wanted the boyfriends to treat you? Then I didn't know what. My friend was um, like so pink me, but as mum back and as I'm playing out, as now I know what sport plays more out, what man plays more out, um. Karen and I and number come dancing mm. to help me, help me, help me to 
đến là bạn ăn mình mời bên anh em bán phục em đây tại thân đến because you you did meet someone and you got married didn't you yeah and yeah that, that marriage has ended now but yeah. when you were in that marriage you did experience some yeah. domestic violence yeah now i it's very hard i know to talk about when you've had domestic violence in your life yeah how what would you like to tell the Royal Commission about that period of life when you were married and you had that experience of domestic violence? Well, I'm sorry, I was married, then I cried, which I thought in love me. So we got married and my uncle, my new friend, Send me as my more unwilling man said. Yeah, then guy takes a good ass on unwilling guy. Right. And then, um, then he sent it on himself on drinks, not bring us a drink, I can go. But so I got so yeah, I I I went my money gone. What about me? What insane insane? What about you? I just said, "Wow, man, I'm no wrong." What so in me in first we we start to. Bowling house, right? I in making for the work, right? I want the class saying, Oh, it's a nine great laws, right? I said, What? They said, Mean that. And then, then, he got angry. He got it. Why did he get angry? Because I know the truth. Hmm. Right? And so now, when he went in quick, he got money. Right? So my gang, I was in bed, he got my arms, and he took my hand. Mm. And and then what the son said, right? You know what my phone talks? I said, yes, man. Mm. That was a lot. Right? And then if we come up to talk on it, they laugh at me. Every time. So what's your attitude now to the cops? Well, that, do you trust them? In way, I'm not thinking what they know. Mm. But one thing I got them at all. Um, I don't know what the red flag thing about. Um, yeah. All right. So you you got out of that marriage, but you went to live in supported uh, supportive residential facility in yeah. Adelaide, and that wasn't a particularly happy place for you. No. And you had a you met a boyfriend when you yeah. were there, and he sort of came to visit you in your room. But yeah. you both got in trouble, didn't you? Yeah. And you were told off in front of everybody in the yeah. house that you, you two shouldn't be together, even if yeah. it was your boyfriend. So 
that what yeah. happened? And you were kicked out of that place. Yeah. Because you were told it was unacceptable to have a boyfriend. Yeah. So Libby, from what you've told us today, you are a survivor. Yeah. Of family violence as a child. Yeah. As a teenager and as an adult mm. in some of the very important relationships in your life with your parents, with your boyfriend and husband. Looking back at your experience, what needs to change so that what happened to you doesn't happen to other people? Yeah. More is really right? In fact, right? I my son not something they have moves. And um and I think when people it's make my feet and moves of pride. Because I know how it moves. And what about relationships? Well, do, you, do you still think that having those uh, a close personal or intimate family relationship is important in your life and what would you like to happen? Well, um, I think as more friends, that makes me, and that makes me work out one thing because I said my asthma. For you. I ain't got asthma. My thing is, it's small talk. Okay. Yeah, I am that in big. Where is my kingma? And thing in big morning. I got smoke. Why? Like, is there anything else you would like to say to the commissioners today? Um, I hope and pray with God that there's more women come more work and kill them for a senior class. And I hope they get what they deserve. Thank you, Libby. How do you feel watching that again? That's a while since we talked to each other. Yeah, yeah. it's quite a while. I was sticking in my soul when I was it. And yeah, it moved okay. over slowly. But go through and listen to and And yeah, thank you for sharing the story. A lot's happened to you in your life. Yeah, and I see we say next say last year that I'm survivor. Yeah, you're a survivor. Um, make that normal people, but. She follows the way I did. Then we'll, um, that's 
my face in front of. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I get it. You did it. And being an advocate, this is something, it's a passion for you now, isn't it? Yes. And you want to be a strong advocate for women? Yeah. And part of telling your story to the Royal Commission is to, as you said, right at the end, you pray to God that other women can come and tell their stories. And if they are in trouble in their families or with their boyfriends or their husbands, they should be able to ask for help. Yeah. And something should be done. Yeah. Very successful. In your place, you woman, but smiling or whoever, that's all get what they deserve. And getting what they deserve means yeah. justice, doesn't it? I think you told me that before. No, justice. but justice. Nothing but justice. But it might mean. Think well, or, or think, 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 love, men in jail for love. Maybe not, not, maybe not death row. No, no, no. But in jail for love. Not it. Yeah. Uh, there. But, strong, but I think it's a strong punishment, isn't it? Yeah, it's no strong. And that a strong punishment is the community saying the treatment of women treatment of women with disability who yeah. experience violence and abuse in their families or sexual abuse, you need a strong punishment. Yes. So the community says this is not right. No. But probably it's not, not death right. right. Okay. Libby, thank you so much for talking to us. Mm -hmm. uh, the commissioners might have some questions for you. They may not. Uh, but we have very much uh, appreciated the time you've spent with us to tell us about your life and sharing a lot of personal family information with us. So thank you very much. It's my I know me here. I'm glad to hear too. You okay. It's my thing me your first. Libby, thank you very much. I, I, I will ask if it's okay with you. I'll ask uh, Commissioner Gelberley if she has any questions or anything that she would like to say to you. Okay. Um, it's nice to see you again, Libby. And, yes, yeah. it's very really nice seeing you. Too. I would like to just thank you so much um, for your appearance today. And, and just to ask you, would you add to your list that the police ought to take you seriously and not laugh at you? They should take you very seriously. And all very the... seriously. It's not good to laugh at. If you do with me, that's what we say, God fuck me. And do you think the police didn't take you seriously because you were disabled? Do you think that's why? I think that took me the reason. Or might be um, a woman. But I didn't say I got no. Um, took me a like this main thing, you know? Yeah. Good luck with your advocacy to get a, a living situation that you would like to. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Galbally. I'll ask uh, Commissioner Bennett first and then Commissioner Mason if they would like to ask you any questions or to uh, say anything to you. Perhaps first, Commissioner Bennett. Thank you, Libby. Um, it was very powerful to hear what you had to say today. Um, violence against women in our community is a terrible, terrible indictment on our community. Um, and it's clear that there is such a shortage of services for women 
experiencing domestic violence, mm. but we are hearing that there is very little for women with disability mm. that um, understand their needs and able to work with them. And it's very heartening to hear that women like you are standing in to fill that gap. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bennett. Commissioner Mason, is there anything you would like to ask Lily or <coughs> say to Lily? Yes, thank you, Chair. Just, just had um, one question for Libby, and thank you so much for your evidence today um, and to putting your experiences on the record of the Royal Commission. Um, you had a, you've got a sister who has supported you um, all of your life. Um, it sounds like you're now being that sister to women with disabilities in Adelaide. Yeah. How important it is do you feel uh, that women with disabilities talk to younger women with disabilities about safety, about these stories of violence and abuse and how they can be safe, um, that they should speak up? And um, can you explain to me how important that is to you, that as a woman with disability, that you're doing that because it sounds like that wasn't given to you when you were growing up, but now you're giving that to uh, young women. Can you tell me a bit about how that um, impacts you? Um, I, it, some very important like short film blue side they not animals they not a cat they not dog they are two things but if you got head and you got hat that makes you a clear thing and I'm saying, oh, women are saying some people not born with names, like they are women. Yes, you're saying that they are women, they are human, they're not animals, they're not a cat or a dog, and they are worthy. Yes. They're human beings and they are worthy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Libby. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Mason. Libby, I too would like to thank you uh, very much. We know that it's uh, not easy to uh, come to the Commission and tell us uh, your own experiences throughout your life of uh, family violence, but you have done that today and you did that in the interview that we saw, that we have watched and listened to very, very carefully. One of the things you said was that you would like to encourage more women to come forward and tell their stories. Uh, by doing that today yourself, I'm sure you have encouraged more women to come forward to the Royal Commission and elsewhere and tell us their own stories of uh, family violence, the stories that they've experienced. So thank you again for coming to us and giving evidence. We very much appreciate the help that you have given us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'll also mention that um, we were joined in the hearing room today when Libby's giving her evidence by Ziggy. Yeah. And she, Ziggy's been with us. So um, just to acknowledge Ziggy's presence as well. It's been yeah. helpful, hasn't it, Libby, to have Ziggy? Yeah. Um, Chair, I'm going to depart from the program and perhaps ask for a five to ten minute um, break before we move to Brisbane for our next um, witness. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll resume at uh, 11 o'clock Hobart time, 10 o'clock uh, Brisbane time. Thank you. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is now in session.
Yes, uh, Ms. Fraser, I think there may now be uh, an, uh, an appearance to be announced. Is that uh, correct? And uh, in the Brisbane hearing room by the legal representatives of Anglicare, if it's now an appropriate time for them to announce their appearance. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, Andrea Tithis, QC. I am instructed by Minter Ellison, and as Ms. Fraser indicated, I appear on behalf of Anglicare Southern Queensland. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, Ms. Fraser. Thank you, Chair. We will now hear from Nikki and Nikki's mum. This is a pseudonym, and the full names of Nikki and Nikki's mum are known to the Royal Commission. I would like content warning number one to be now be placed on the screen. If the evidence that you're about to hear raises concerns for you, please contact 1800 RESPECT on 1800 737 732, the Blue Knot Counselling and Referral Service on 1800 421 468, Lifeline on 13 11 14, or Beyond Blue on 1300 224 636. Nikki was sexually assaulted at a respite centre of Anglicare Southern Queensland in 2018. Nikki and Nikki's mum pre-recorded their evidence with Miss Eastman on 6 August 2021. The document identifier for the pre-recorded evidence of Nikki and her mum is document number IND 0146.0000 Zero one dot zero 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 one. I would ask that that recording now be played. Can I ask you to tell the Royal Commission uh, about yourself? I'm basically went from right through from preschool to year twelve, and then I went straight into this day respite. What was it like going to school? Did you like going to school? I loved it because I had nice friends and all that. Yeah. And yeah. what did you want to do after you left school? Um, basically work with mum and dad. Yeah. And, then... and so when you're talking about going to respite, what can you tell us about respite? It was just like a day, day respite centre. Basically we do activities and go on outings and all that. And what sorts of things do you like doing at respite and just generally when you're hanging out? Well, I like doing diamond art and that, yeah. And then helping mum and dad with the and listen to my music and that. What music do you like? Country music. Country really? Music. Yeah. Nikki, you live with a disability. Do you want to tell the Royal Commission about your disability? Uh, it's a big one. Smith McGannis syndrome. What's that? Uh, it's a chromosome gene where part of number 17 is missing and I get the shakes and, and all that really badly. Yeah. So I'm on medication for it. And, um, and how does your disability affect your day-to-day -day life? Mm, no, it doesn't affect me at all, really. Mm -hmm. I just live with it. Mm. Now, um, I want to ask you now about something that happened back in September 2018, and I know it's a hard thing to talk about. Yep. And so you've, you've prepared a statement for the Royal Commission, and yes. you want to read the statement? Yes, I do. I was sexually assaulted at the respite day centre in Queensland. The perpetrator was not another client of this service who was new to the area. I told my dad about it a couple of days later because I was still processing it and was had a meeting with the centre the next Monday. We told the centre about it, the violence and then we told the local police. The police were really helpful down to earth, explained things well and believed me peacefully specifically. or specifically the Child Protection Investigation Unit 
the police did a video interview recording with me and took a recording of me walking from the respite center to outside where the assault happened. My mum and dad and my GP all believed me too. My GP did lots of tests to make sure I was safe and healthy. I started seeing a nice counsellor at Lowell Place, which was suggested straight away by the police. Some of the workers from the day respite were helpful, believe me, and wrote down this happened. Some other workers didn't believe me and kept trying to ask me for information about the court case. There was, there were begging to know what happened when they kept asking me about what happened. It made me feel unsafe and at the centre. One of them tried to tell me it didn't happen at all. I told them it wasn't their business. The DPP were really helpful. I went and sat with them in the city. They showed me around the courthouse and the room that I was going to be in if I had to talk to the judge and the lawyers. He changed his mind lots of times in the court and changed his plea from guilty and not guilty. More security cameras at the respite centre to make people feel safer. Don't keep asking them about what happened. Believe people when they say something has happened. More training for carers and manage for the respite service about responding to sexual assaults. Mm. Nikki, thanks for reading that. And, um, and I know that's a hard thing to talk about and to tell the Royal Commission. Mm. But thank you very much for sharing that that's experience. Okay. Um, are you okay if I ask you a few questions? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. And one of the things you just mentioned at the end is you said, don't keep asking about what happened. Believe people when they say something has happened. Yeah. And that's an outcome that you'd like to see. Yes. And for you, the people who are closest to you believed mm. you. Yes. Mm. And when they believed you, that made you feel safe. It did, yep. It made it okay to tell yep. somebody what had happened? Yep. Mm. And that was a bit different to the workers who didn't believe you? Yeah. So when they didn't believe you, you said it made you feel unsafe at the centre. I, it did, yeah. Why, why did that make you feel unsafe? Because they just, they weren't even around at the time when it happened. Okay. One of them tried to tell you it didn't happen at all. How did that make you feel? Oh, I was fuming at the time. You've also said as one of your suggestions, more training for the carers and managers of respite yes. services in responding yes. to sexual assaults. Yep. So as one of the parts of training is about when you hear a person tell you that they've been assaulted, mm. that you believe them. Yeah. And support them. Yeah. And that's your, your other point about having more security cameras at the centres to make people feel safer. Exactly, yeah. There were some cameras at the centre, weren't there? There was only one. One, but it didn't it didn't cover the area where the assault no. happened. And there were security cameras over the hospital as well. Yeah. And it didn't basically get to where it was happening. Okay. Mm. I also wanted to ask you uh, if it's okay, and just let oh. me know, is yeah. the police suggested going to see um, a counsellor at Laurel Place. Yes. And that was did. straight away. Mm. And before that, you'd never had to see a counsellor at all. No, no. So this is a pretty new thing. It is. Okay. And what, what was your experience like? What was it like when you saw the counsellor? Did you find that helpful? It did, yes, it did, yeah. It did, okay, yeah. And, and so one of the reasons you wanted to come and talk to the Royal Commission today was that telling them about what happened to you might help yeah. other people feel that they can tell. The Royal and, Commission. And they can trust yeah. people to say, this is what happened to me. Exactly, yeah. They don't have to keep it a secret. No. And they don't have to be ashamed. No. They don't, okay? And they've even got their own voice to speak up about it. And what's it like to have your own voice to speak up about it? How important is that? 
feels great to speak up and that, yeah. Nikki's experience has also had an effect on the family and you've watched how uh, people have responded to Nikki and the impact on Nikki of these events that go back to September 2018, is that right? Yes. So can I ask you a little bit about your daughter? I've asked her to give a description of what she's like and she's very modest other than disclosing the side of things. But can you tell us about Nikki uh, growing up and, and um, a little bit about your family? She's very social, so she does enjoy, was until this happened, going to um, a, a centre where she can mix with other people and be, you know, doing her own thing to, to a certain degree, mm. as much as possible in a small place. Yeah. Right. So can I um, now ask you some questions about what occurred in September 2018? So you were away at the time and uh, you became aware that Nikki had reported the assault to uh, your husband? Yeah, the actual, the actual day that the assault happened, I was still here, but I came home and, sorry, came home and um, didn't say anything about it. I went away the next day and it wasn't for a few, till a few days later that it got, and when she had to think about going back to the centre the next week, that it all came out and she told her father, she'd obviously been stressing about it. Um, and he rang me straight away. We talked about it over the phone and so on. Um, yeah. So, yes, yeah, so I was away when she disclosed, yes. So the, the first thing that happened was then uh, a meeting with the staff at the respite centre. Yes. And you had the impression that they didn't really know what to do. Yes, I did. And um, I think you said you felt like they had their head in the sand. It was a lot easier for it just to go away rather than to have to do something about it. Is that right? Uh, generally, that picture, yeah. I think the immediate, the staff that my husband saw at the time, well, they had to ring up and find out what to do. Um, and the head of the organisation from the bigger centre said, oh, well, that's a police matter. And, um, yeah. So who, so who reported the matter to the police? Was that, that your husband or someone from the respite centre? Yes. So husband. your husband? Yes. And then uh, the police came to your home and I think Nikki said that she did talk to the police. Is that right? To the local police, yes. The local police. Then who? there was a referral to the child protection unit. Yes. And, um, and in terms of the, that experience with the police and specifically the child protection unit, um, what's your reflection on that? What was that experience like? Um, well, we found them very helpful and very good at um, guiding. <laughs> I've done it again, sorry. It's okay. Nikki. <laughs> uh, guiding our daughter and um yeah they because they are trained in that area we thought they were much better able so, to do and so uh nikki's just said that the police made the suggestion about getting some counseling right at the the outset and um and what's what did you observe about that what did you see about that how did that have an impact on nikki um i think it to help a process and to get the anger out. So uh, are we right in understanding that the police undertook an investigation and that included uh, taking a, a video recorded interview for Nikki and also, as I think as you say in the statement, looking at the CCTV footage. And the matter then progressed to the perpetrator being charged Yes. And then the matter then proceeded to a court 
proceeding. Is that right? Yes. And yes. you say the perpetrator was charged with rape and carnal knowledge of a person with an impairment of the mind. So that's what the police told you the charge was? Yes. Um, and he pled guilty to the second... Second charge. Charges. How's things been for the family and what you've seen for, for Nicky since he's been sentenced and is no longer in a position of, of being in the town or having to run into him? Uh, it was like a, a cloud lifted that now that there was no chance of him running into him or him being around the community and that he was punished for the crime that he committed. It's, um, yeah, it's quite a weight off his shoulders. Now, can I ask you some questions about the respite centre? Uh, I think you've said in your statement, you think that there needs to be some training for the staff at the centre uh, mm -hmm. to better respond to these issues, but also, as I understand it, to ensure that it doesn't happen in the first place. It's not simply yes. a matter of let it happen and then let's respond to it, but having some clearer safeguards to uh, ensure that Nikki and others who go to the respite centre can go there knowing that they're feeling safe and that there's not the risk that they'll be subject to any violence or abuse. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, I believe so. I, there should be some sort of training towards any scenario that can can happen when you're dealing with vulnerable people. Do, were you, before Nikki went to that respite centre, did you have any concerns about what her safety and her welfare might be at the centre? No, but that was a long time ago. It was 18, 18 years ago we worked out that she first became involved with the centre, which was set up to help mm. the members of the community. Um, and she was happy to go and everything seemed to be running well and went along for a long time. And, um, and then uh, it changed, uh, what's the word? Um, it came under the umbrella of a very big organisation a few years ago, probably a couple of years ago, before, a couple of years before this incident at the most, and things changed. But my, I think that a big organisation that size should have in place training for um, all staff. We've also flagged um, having better policies so that people of concern, as you say, somebody who may have a criminal history or something concerning in their history, but yeah. they're screened before they come to work at a centre like the Respite Centre, is that right? Yes, yes, definitely. What um, support if anything, did the respite centre provide to Nikki or to the family generally? None. Absolutely. Was there any any offer of support? No. The only um, thing that happened was that two long term workers who'd known her since she first went there were let us know that they were absolutely mortified but that's about all that we couldn't really have a conversation about it that was at the center so that was all that was said there was nothing from anyone who was in charge of the center or nothing from the overriding um organization until an audit happened um last year and that's when I voiced, or we voiced our concerns about it, about that. And I got a letter afterwards of kind of apology, but. When you say kind of apology, <laughs> what, did you consider it to be an apology? Um, I, I didn't feel that it, you know, it, really, it was on paper, but it didn't feel very, um, Genuine, I guess, is the word. 
Did, uh, Ed, did any, before you got that letter, did anyone contact you to say, would you like an apology? And if so, what would you like us to say in the apology? Not at all. No. Not at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it, has there been any offer of assistance to support Nikki in terms of counselling or support the family at all? No, not at all. Uh, has there been any steps taken to have any other type of redress? And I think you've mentioned in your statement that the victim support unit has been very good in assisting with some applications. So there's a process in, on foot at the moment, is that right? Uh, yes, but that's mainly um, uh, getting compensation for our expenses and um, that sort of thing. That's that, pay, that paperwork sort of side of it. But as the organisation itself, no, nothing. The only um, thing that's happened is since this letter, I've actually had a chance to meet the lady who uh, wrote the letter recently. And I told her that I would like to have a meeting with someone to find out if things have been put in place or um, if policy, what policy is. And I have yet heard nothing. So nothing. I'll wait and see if anything happens. But I mean, that's only recently, I have to say. Um, but I intend so, to. So, sort of reflecting back on these events, um, what would you like to share with the Royal Commissioners about a way forward? There probably needs to be some sort of uh, checks and balances. Um, in the hierarchy of the uh, of the organisation that's providing the care, um, uh, accountability, and training for the um, staff who are looking after the vulnerable people with disabilities or aged or whatever it is. Can I thank both of you so much uh, mm -hmm. for sharing these experiences with the Royal Commission and for the suggestions that you've made about change. And Nikki, as you said, having a voice to be able to speak up and tell people what occurred. Yes, Ms. Fraser. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I understand that we will now break for morning tea. All right. Uh, what time should we resume? Should we resume at 12 noon Hobart time, 11 a.m. Brisbane time? Chair, I'm in your hands. Um, from my perspective, it's not necessary that we have that amount of break, but I'm in your hands. Well, the program that I provided with suggests that Ms. Cumming will commence her evidence at 12 noon. So uh, if uh, this will allow us to maintain that. So uh, let's come back then at, at 12 noon, Hobart time, 11 a.m. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is now in session. Yes, Ms. Fraser. Thank you, Chair. I'm joined in the Brisbane hearing room by Ms. Caroline Cumming of Anglicare. I would ask that the oath be administered to Ms. Cumming now. I will read you the oath. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cumming. Ms. Cumming, you've given a statement. Ms. Cumming, sorry, Ms. Cumming, thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission. I'd just like to indicate where all the commissioners are so that you are aware of it. Uh, I appreciate that you're in the Brisbane hearing room. Um, we have uh, Commissioner Bennett and Commissioner Mason in the Hobart hearing room. And we have Commissioner Galbally participating in the hearing from Melbourne. I'm participating in the hearing from the Sydney hearing room, and as you know, Ms. Fraser, who was about to ask you some questions, is in the Brisbane hearing room as well. And I will now ask Ms. Fraser to ask you some questions. Thank you. <clears throat>
Thank you, Chair. Ms Cumming, you have given a statement to this Royal Commission? Yes. And the statement is dated the 18th of February, 2022? Yes. And you gave the statement in response to a notice to give information or a statement in writing dated 31 January, 2022? Yes, that's correct. Commissioners, you will find Ms Cumming's statement is document STAT.0507.0001 dot zero 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 one and it is found at tab three in tender bundle B. Ms Cumming, you are employed by Anglicare as the service manager, community, aged and disability for Brisbane North Region. Yes. And you have held this role since March of 2019. Yes. The Royal Commission has just heard the evidence of Nikki and Nikki's mum. And you were present during the time that that evidence was played, weren't you? I was. Anglicare provided services to Nikki from August 2016, didn't they? Yes. And those services were for on average three days per week. Yes. And during that time, Nikki would participate in a range of activities. Correct. Ms Cumming, on the 17th of September 2018, Nikki and her father met with Anglicare staff to report that Nikki had been sexually assaulted, didn't they? They did, yes. And you agree that a report of sexual assault at that time should have been addressed under Anglicare's Incident Management Procedure and Harm Prevention and Response for Adults with Disability Procedure? Yes, it should have. And you have a copy of that procedure with you for your reference at tab 11, of volume one of the tender bundle and commissioners, that is document ASQ 5005.0001.119. And to repeat, that's tab 11 of tender bundle B. Ms Cumming, I won't ask you to look at that document just yet. Um, you were familiar with that um, procedure and what is required under that procedure? Um, at the time, I wasn't aware of that procedure. Are you now aware of that procedure? I am now aware. Uh, and you would accept, wouldn't you, that in relation to Nikki's assault and Anglicare's subsequent response, <laughs> that the procedure was not followed in a number of respects? Yes. <clears throat> Could I ask you to refer briefly to paragraph 58 of your statement. I'll give you a moment. That's on page 13 of the document. Yes. I've got that now. You'll see there that it records service manager directed staff to refer the matter to police in accordance with the incident management procedure. You can see that? Yes. But that isn't what happened, is it? Um, no, the the um, service manager told the staff to get the parents to call the police. Yes, so the service manager directed staff yes. to tell Nikki's father to report to police. Yes. You say at paragraph 61 of your mm. statement that it was Anglicare's practice to recommend uh, that clients or their families report to police. But you accept, don't you, that that is inconsistent with the procedures that were in place at the time? I do, yes. Specifically, it's inconsistent with the harm prevention and response for adults with disability yes, procedure. Could I ask you to turn to the document at tab 12 of your tender bundle? Commissioners tab 12 at tender bundle B. The document is called Quality Indicators Report, August to October 2018. Yes. Ms. Cumming, can you tell me who prepares this report? Um, I believe it's someone from uh, Governance Risk and Assurance. And where, where does this report go to? To the community services, no, the community. 
Fair Governance Committee. So is this a document that is prepared for the purpose of compliance? Um, I think so, I'm not sure. It's. Could I ask you to turn to page 36 of that document? And you'll see there's a table there. Yes. The second entry to the table has a date 11 September 2018. And you accept, don't you, that while Nikki's and her father reported the incident on the 17th of September, the incident ultimately occurred on the 11th of September yes. 2018. And the reference is the centre in which the assault occurred? Yes, it is. So we can see there in the um, second uh, column from the right that there's a number of notations made there, including as the second last notation, incident reported to police. Oh, yes. But it is not clear on that document, is it, that the incident was ultimately reported to police by the parents? No, it's not. Anglicare's formal documented procedures, such as the uh, document that we referred to earlier, the Harm Prevention and Response for Adults with Disability Procedure, has that document been amended in any way to provide that families now report incidents to police? No, not to my knowledge. So it continues to be the responsibility of Anglicare. It does. You record at paragraph 71 of your statement that Anglicare staff recommended to Nikki uh, and Nikki's uh, family, that they seek an appointment with Nikki's GP as soon as possible? Yes. And you then go on to say the reason why that recommendation was made mm. by Anglican. Ms Cumming, it's not correct, is it, that the recommendation to attend the GP was one made by Anglican? Um, our, our lifestyle lead at the time did recommend that they see the GP and I followed up with her to make sure it was for those reasons. Okay. And the Could police I, did as well. So can I ask you to turn to paragraph 77 of your statement? Yes. And you see there it reads, it appears from a dated note on 17 September and confirmed by the lifestyle lead that the detective who subsequently spoke with Nikki's dad also advised Nikki to take her to the GP. Yes. Ms Cumming, could I ask you to have a look at document number two, uh, sorry, document uh, at tab 23 of the tender bundle? Yes, I've got that. Just going back a moment, you mentioned to me earlier that Anglicare um, recommended in the first instance that Nikki's uh, be taken to the GP. Could you be mistaken with respect to that recollection at all? I could be. It, I wasn't there at the time and it was what was reported to me later on. And specifically, if we have a look at this document, which is at tab 23, we see there that it is a... Uh, progress note oh, yes. dated 17 September from the lifestyle lead that talks about a phone call between Nikki's uh, dad mm. and the progress lead and it records there he was also advised to take Nikki to the GP for checkup and to be tested for any sexually transmitted disease. Yes. Ms Cumming, do you accept that the only document that Anglicare has produced to this Royal Commission that relates to an ultimate referral to the GP is this document? Yes. And 
you would accept, wouldn't you, that based on this document, it appears that it was the police who ultimately referred Nikki to the GP? Uh, yes. And that there's it no other... That way. Yeah. Sorry, I cut you off there. So, yeah, no, it, it does, yeah. And you would accept that there is no other supporting documentation that supports the suggestion that Anglicare also made that recommendation? Yes. <clears throat> the procedure that we've referred to earlier, the harm prevention and response uh, for adults with disability procedure, provides that if a victim has experienced sexual assault, uh, that with the victim's consent, they should be referred to the nearest sexual, uh, acute sexual service for the purpose of initial counselling and medical examination. Ms Cumming, that didn't occur in this instance, did it? No. The document also records, um, oh, sorry, if we could turn to your um, statement, paragraph 79, your statement there records the Anglicare incident management procedure does not refer to post-incident supports other than those referred to in a previous paragraph. Um, yes. Ms Cumming, the statement that's recorded there at paragraph 79 is not correct, is it? Um. For the incident management procedure? Yes. I can take you specifically um, to page 12 of that procedure. Oh, yes. At item 15, and we see... It yes. provides for follow-up and support to client and parent care. Absolutely, yes. Yes. And we see there that the first bullet point is to provide or arrange for additional support, follow-up or debriefing for the adult with a disability and or their parent yes. carer. So accepting that the statement says that there was no requirement, that paragraph that there does, would indicate yes. there was. And... That didn't occur in this instance, did it? No. Ms Cumming, it's the case, isn't it, that prior to July 2020, Anglicare didn't provide any follow-up to Nikki or her parents, did they? No. Between the time... Sorry. Um, it was not actually until there was an NDIS audit in July of 2020, that Anglicare ultimately identified that that follow-up hadn't been provided to Nikki or her family, wasn't it? That's correct, yes. And there was then subsequently a letter sent by you on the 20th of July, 2020. Yes. Almost two years after the incident. Yes. And a copy of that letter, Commissioners, appears at tab 44 of Tender Bundle B. Ms Cumming, you had a meeting with Nikki's mother on the 31st of October 2021? Um, I think it was earlier in October, but yes. If we have a look at, sorry, 20th of, 20th October, of October, my apologies. Yes, yes, yes. If we have a look at um, the document at tab 31 of the tender bundle, commissioners, for your reference, you accept, Ms Cumming, that that's a note of your meeting with Nikki's mum? Yes. And you have noted in that file note um, from that meeting that an apology for the incident was extended by you to Nikki's mum? Yes. Before you made um, the apology, did you ask uh, Nikki or Nikki's mum what they were ultimately, what they would consider to be an appropriate apology? No, I didn't. 
Ms. Cumming, just a couple of final questions. Yes. Has Anglicare considered providing Nikki with any form of redress? Not to my knowledge. Is this something that Anglicare would consider? Um, I, I would think so. Um, as part of this process, we're learning quite a bit and I can take it to our executive. Thank you, Ms. Cumming. Yeah. Nothing further, Chair. Yes, thank you. <coughs> Ms. Cumming, uh, when we go to the uh, <coughs> document behind tab 44, What were you intending to apologise for? Um, unfortunately, it was an apology for me um, taking uh, so long to provide an outcome to the investigation. Given Francis today, there were a lot more things to apologise for, weren't there? There, there are. Um, and have, have, has an apology been extended in respect of the other failings by Anglicare to which you have agreed today? I haven't yet. I was going to provide a p apology here and we would follow up with the family. Why has it taken so long? We're now uh, at the end of March 2022. Um, it's going through this process. We have been able to identify a lot of gaps with how we <coughs> have managed this particular assault incident. Yes. When did you identify the gaps? Um, we started with looking through for the statement and then in the last couple of weeks um, <clears throat> doing even a deeper dive with the um, lawyers in, pre so, in preparation for the hearing. Do I, do I gather from that answer that the process of trying to identify where gaps were in the procedures for dealing with uh, this particular case, were that that procedure that you followed <coughs> was prompted by the statements that were produced by Nikki and Nikki's mum for the purposes of this hearing. Um, yes, we, there were some some gaps identified with our uh, incident and complaint management and investigation through a Deloitte review uh, from 2019 and then a follow-up in 2021. And our um, executive have started that process of improving that area of, um, of Anglicare. By the time you wrote the letter of the 20th of July, and I'll come back to the form of the letter in a moment. By the time you wrote the letter of the 20th of July, 2020, you were aware of the number of the defects uh, in uh, the procedures that Anglicare had adopted, in addition to those for which you apologised in the letter. That's correct, isn't it? Um, I, I wasn't aware of a lot of, a lot of those and, and what was happening in head office with our incidents and complaints investigations at that time. Who wrote this letter? Uh, I did. Why didn't you trouble to check with head office as to what was going on and what gaps had been identified? I agree I should have and I, I regret that I didn't follow up. Who do you report to? Well, let me start again. In July 2020, who did you report to at Anglican? Um, our group manager. Located where? Uh, she manages all of the different regions within community aged and disability. 
In Queensland? In Queensland, yes. Why didn't she write this letter? Um, I, I I can't answer that. I I, I don't know. I, did she? Hop, I did didn't. She, I could sorry, have referred she, to her. Right. Does she still hold that position today? Uh, yes, she does. Why isn't she here? Why are you here and not her? Um, because I was the person who wrote the letter and the commission asked that I be the person to appear. As the person to who was the person to whom you reported had any involvement in this case at all, to your knowledge? Um, do, you, do you mean like at the moment preparing for the hearing or in 2018? Well, let's start with 2018, then we'll go to 2020 and then we'll come to the hearing. Has that 2018? So in 2018, um, yeah, she, Sue, so, sorry, our group manager was aware of the incident, yes. So that in 2020 she was also aware of the incident? Um, she was um, and copied into the email requesting the outcome. And she was aware at that time that there had been at least one review or possibly two conducted, uh, that is in 2020, into the circumstances of this case and in particular gaps that uh, might be identified? Yeah, the, the review was um, of all of our incident management and, and complaints investigations, and um, I, I think that the group manager may have been aware. What was the exact date of that review? And if you don't know, Ms Fraser might be able to tell us by identifying the document. I, I, I don't know the exact date of the review. You able to help us, Ms. Fraser? Uh, I, I didn't get that. Sorry. I will just take a moment to um, attempt to source that chair. <coughs> and uh, Ms. Cumming, you've said that uh, the harm prevention and response for adults with a disability procedure was a document that you were not familiar with in 2018. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. When did you first become aware that there was such a document? Um, when we were preparing my statement. That is a document uh, which, uh, on its face, says the effective date is the 31st of October 2015, and there was a review date of the 31st of October 2017. If you go to the document uh, behind tab 11, you will see that on page one. Yes, yes. <clears throat> How is it possible for someone in your position not to be aware of that procedure? Um, I, I, I probably should have been aware of that. I, I knew of the incident management. I was not aware of the harm and prevention. Say that again. I'm sorry, I didn't quite. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, yes, you, you would think that someone in my position would have been aware of that particular document. Um, in searching for documents, it was difficult at that time. You had to have the name of the, sorry, specific name of the document to find it on our system. Have and you ever raised have you ever raised with senior management what the point of having a procedure would be is, sorry, the point of a procedure is if it's not distributed to staff who should be responsible or are responsible for implementing the procedure? I I haven't. Um, I have alerts now that will send through any updates, documents or new documents. What have you done to ensure that members of staff who are 
who are answerable or report to you or to people under you? What have you done to ensure that they are familiar with this procedure? Um, I have the coordinators as a level um, underneath me in my role as service manager and they have got the alerts where they receive updates for documents um, through email and um, policy updates. And then they need to be distributing that to the team leads or be aware of it in case it's ever required. And what have you and what, what have you or Anglicare have done to ensure that the procedure is actually read and understood by everybody who may be responsible for giving effect to it. Again, I um, rely on the service coordinators and the multidisciplinary team coordinator to ensure that they have read that. Um, and I have learned that in, when we do have something happen, we will go and review the policy or the procedure. I suppose you might think that uh, the uh, person to whom you reported to uh, assumed uh, that uh, enough would be done to ensure that uh, you had seen the procedure in 2018 to 2020, yet apparently you hadn't. Um, I, I, I I can't, I can't answer that. No. So can you just uh, please uh, assist me once again? Could you tell us exactly what you personally, because uh, I understand you can't answer for those who, uh, to whom you report, but what do you personally intend to do by way of an apology to Nikki and Nikki's parents for the failures of the systems which have been identified today and any other failures that may come to light. Okay. Um, yeah, look, in this forum, I personally, and on behalf of Anglicare, we acknowledge that what happened to Nikki and um, the impact on her and her family is devastating. Um, and... I would like to work with my group manager in formulating an apology and trying to meet with Nikki and her parents to discuss and apologise. Um, it We didn't manage it very well. We didn't have the policies and processes in place to support Nikki and her family, and we regret that. Um, that, that I carry that regret, um, and we we also um, didn't engage openly as per our values of care, love, hope, and humility. Sorry. Um, That's all right. Take your time. It's coming. If you want to have a break, that's okay. <coughs> no. Um, and I, I know that I need care, and I'll, me personally, I've learned from this. Um, and I just want to offer my deepest apology to Nikki and her family for not fully engaging. And... Um, supporting them as they required or needed. Sorry. <clears throat> That's all right. I've got, I've got another question or two I want, <coughs> I want to ask you, so if you do want to take a break, that's perfectly all right. <sighs> you prefer me to go on? Yes, please. All right. <clears throat> In your statement, uh, question 22, uh, has Anglicare provided any form of redress <coughs> to uh, Nikki with respect to the incident? If so, when, what was the redress? If not, why? 
your answer was, to the best of my knowledge, no redress has been provided to Nikki, and this has not been requested. What did, what did you mean by saying this has not been requested? Um, uh, the, the, the family hadn't approached us, um, which... I, I realise it's it's something that we should approach them about. Well, that was what I was going to ask you because if that is what you were conveying, and I just wanted to clear up the possible ambiguity, then it implies that uh, somebody in your care who has suffered something which in your words is devastating is expected to come to you to ask for redress rather than angle yeah. care taking the initiative yeah. and offering some form of redress. That, that's, in fact, what happens. Yeah, and, and that's not correct. Not, not right. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I'll ask other Chair. commissioners, if I may. Yes. Sorry, Chair. Sorry, Chair. Just before we um, move to the other commissioners, you did ask whether there was any document um, that gave a particular date for um, the review that had been referred to. Yes. The um, document that I would best identify for you is the document at tab 30, uh, which is um, has a date of 8 July 2020 and refers to uh, or the subject of which is NDIS audit feedback from participant interviews. <coughs> Yes, and that is a document I see that tab 30 in my document is a one-page document. That's the only document, sorry, Chair, that bears any um, or has any reference to a particular review date. That's, that's the best that I could point you to. So we don't have, as far as you're aware, the document that constituted the review. That's correct. I see. Uh, Commissioner Bennett, do you have any questions of Ms Cummings? Um, yes, Ms Cummings, I'd like to just briefly discuss some of the information that you've provided in page 26 um, and 27 of your statement. And this is particularly requesting that staff be mindful of relationships um, between clients. And it lists what staff need to do about monitoring, um, doing a risk assessment, informing parents. Have you got that in front of you? Yes, I do. We have heard over the last few days about how that people with disability are often not given adequate information or understanding about respectful relationships, about consent and choice and the right to make their own choices. Do you think that those strategies should also be uh, staff? talking with those people about what constitutes respectful relationships and consent um, and choice in having those relationships? Uh, absolutely. Um, and I see it's not here, but we have a lifestyle lead at the respite centre in question does try to incorporate that into her program of being having um, yeah respectful relationships, and we need to work with the staff as well. So yes, absolutely. Because at the moment it reads very much like action to be taken against um, uh -huh. a monitoring uh -huh. regime, <laughs> um, and that, as I said, time and time again that good information and education and support. Yes. Um, would you agree 
is a critical part of mitigation? Yes, yes. And we, I didn't mean that to sound like that because I understand that everyone has the right to a relationship um, and it's it's teaching people the the best way to have, no, not the best, but, you know, how to have a safe relationship, um, boundaries, etc. cetera. And, and you, and you yeah. say that does occur? Um, our lifestyle lead has told me that she does try to work with the people there, the um, participants at the respite centre, um, what uh, appropriate boundaries um, and social behaviour. And is there a, a professional way in which that information um, has mm. been developed that is accessible in various forms of communication? No. So that's something that we will have to work on. And drawing on the expertise of advocacy yes. groups and people with disability Absolutely. on how yes. those conversations can be held and supported? Yes, that, that's an improvement that we can, we can have. No further questions, mm -hmm. Chair. Thank you. I'm sorry, I was on mute. Seems to be a repetitive fault on my part. Uh, Commissioner Mason, do you have any questions for uh, Ms Cumming? Thank you, Chair. I just had a, a quick question, and thank you, uh, Ms Cummings, for your evidence today. Uh, we referred to this document behind tab 12, uh, the Quality Indicators Report, August to October 2018. And the uh, on page thirty six, the uh, incident was um, identified as major in that table. Um, and uh, just looking at pages further into the document, and I'm not, I'm not quite sure if I've looked at the right page, but I was interested in. Um, other categories which are minor, moderate, major and extreme. And I'd imagine uh, moderate and minor and major would probably get categorised much more often than extreme. And my question is, uh, is Ang Anglicare perhaps considering in re-looking at these categories given your evidence today, uh, because there's, there seems to be a gap between mm. action and prioritising um, against this category of major in relation to uh, the assault, sexual assault. Just was interested in yeah. your view. Yeah, I've had a, um, a recent discussion with our um, executive director and, yes, we will definitely be reviewing that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner Gelfry, do you have any questions of Ms. Cummings? No, th thank you um, very much for your evidence. And just to follow up Commissioner Bennett's um, question about primary prevention, do you envisage undertaking a review to ensure that whether, whether there is a strong enough um, emphasis on education and involvement, and you know the re a review potentially with a an organi led by an organisation of people with disabilities who may be able to assist. I just wondered if you think the lifestyle um, area for this is adequate. <laughs> um, yes, and that's been another discussion point that we will definitely be looking at a review and more robust education for staff okay. to, to be across lifestyle and to prevent this from happening. It wasn't a, the staff so much as the participants as well that they oh, yeah. be really involved um, in this. Yes. So, yeah. 
Yes, yes. And and we are um, across the organisation looking at more client participation in these teachings and um, learnings. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you, uh, Commissioner Mason. Uh, Mr. Andrea Peters, is that, I'm sorry, is that how I, have I pronounced your name correctly? I hope I have. You have, thank you very much, Chair. Yes, do you have uh, any any application to make any questions of uh, uh, to Ms. Uh, Cummins? I do, if I could uh, be given leave to ask Ms Cummings about uh, two matters, or at least one. And what would that matter be? Uh, in relation to the questioning about whether or not uh, Anglicare suggested to Nikki's family that Nikki see a doctor. And right. secondly, whether... Go on. My apologies. No, no, and go on. secondly... And secondly, uh, a hypothetical, assuming uh, on, the, on, the, on the assumption that Nikki and her family were here, whether there's anything Ms Cumming would like to say to them. I'll give you leave to ask the first question. Um, I'll ask Ms Fraser, do you have anything to say about the second question? Uh, that uh, Mr. Andrew T proposes to us. Uh, Chair, it would be my um, position that Ms. Cumming has, in fact, already addressed that um, in the responses that she has given to the Commission today. Mr. Andrew T is there anything that uh, the second question that you wish to ask would add, could add to what is uh, transpired today? other than perhaps the tense in which it was uh, answered, uh, instead of it being perspective, what would she actually do right now? But but I won't take it, I won't press for that, Chair. I, yes, I think the answer to that, Mr. Andrew Tegas, is for the matter to be taken away, given serious consideration and an appropriate, uh, appropriate steps taken. So I'll give you leave to ask the first question or first one or two questions arising out of uh, the reference to a uh, referral to a doctor. So go ahead. Thank you, Chair. It's a document that's referred to in paragraph 32 of Ms Cummings' statement. Uh, operator, the doc ID is ASQ.5006.0001. You. Can you see mm. that was coming? No. Yes, I can now. And do you recognise what that document is? Yes, it's our um, incident report. And could I ask the operator to please go to dot zero two zero nine, which is the twenty nine. No, is that the first page? Down the bottom of the page, please. You can keep scrolling down for me. Yes, could you stop there? Uh, can you see the words service coordinator, then something's been struck out? Can, can that be a bit larger for me, please? I can see service coordinator. Could you read the rest to yourself? Could you read that sentence, please? Can you see it? Which one are you looking at? Describe immediate action, service coordinator, then oh, there's a black describe. line. Okay. I'm looking at the wrong, sorry, I was looking at the wrong thing. No, that was my fault, sorry. Okay, yes. Uh, can you, for the uh, benefit of the commissioners, uh, just briefly explain what that is intended to be? Um, the immediate action is, is what the staff who had the incident reported to them um, took as a 
as a response, the, the immediate response to the action. And is it a, a record um, made when? Do you know? Oh, at the time of um, adding the incident into the uh, system, um, if any, because the immediate action should have been taken as soon as we knew about the incident. So that would be put into or entered into the incident at that time. And does that note help uh, you with your it, recollection as it to... It does. It does? Thank you. I have no further questions, commissioners. Thank you. Uh, it's coming just arising out of that. I noticed that in that document in the left-hand column, it's referred to as elder abuse. Can we bring that document back up? Why, why is it referred to as elder abuse? Um, I wasn't there at the time when that was done, um, but I, I I would have to, I haven't, I can only surmise, so um, no, look, I don't, don't know. If, if you don't, it's if you further don't, educate. Uh, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, I take it that no other council has an application to ask the government's coming any questions. Pause for a moment to confirm that that is the case. Thank you. In that case, uh, and Ms. Fraser, I take it there's nothing else from you as far as Ms. Cumming is concerned? No, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Cumming, for uh, coming to the Commission in order to give evidence uh, today. Uh, we appreciate the assistance that you have given to the Royal Commission in your evidence. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Ms. Fraser, um, we should now adjourn, I take it, until what time? Till uh, 2 p.m. Uh, Sydney and Hobart time, 1 p.m. Brisbane time, Chair. Yes, thank you very much. Well, then we'll adjourn until that time. That is 2 p.m. Sydney Hobart time and 1 p.m. Uh, Brisbane time. Thank you. The Royal thank Commission you. is adjourned. Yes, Ms. Eastman. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Commissioners. This afternoon, I'm very pleased that we have a panel of advocates and experts from Women with Disability Australia. Uh, our panel members have given their affirmations and I'll briefly uh, introduce them. So Caroline Pramada joins us, Marley Hermans joins us, and Tess Moody. All right, Chair, I just think you might not be, are you, okay, you're off mood. Thank you. Um, Ms. Ramada, Ms. Moody, Ms. Hermans, thank you very much indeed, uh, both for coming to the Royal Commission in Hobart, even though in Sydney we can't actually see you on the screen at the moment, but I'm sure you will emerge very shortly. Um, we're also very grateful to uh, WWDA for all of the very, very considerable assistance uh, you have provided in uh, the uh, assisting in the preparations for this uh, hearing. We're very grateful for those contributions which have made for a very important hearing and a hearing that uh, has covered uh, a very large range of issues. So we want to thank you both for your attendance at this panel and also for everything you've done to assist the hearing uh, that has been held this week in Hobart and uh, in Britain. Yes, thank you. Uh, I still can't see the panelists. Um, I don't know if others are in the same position. Well, I think we might just press on, and I hope, Chair, that um, that you'll be able to but see. And, uh, now, now it's been remedied. Thank you very much. Now we can, at least I can see you. I hope everybody else can as well. Thank you. I might start by just making some introductory comments. So Women with Disability Australia, I'm going to refer to as WIDA, if that's okay with you, is a national disabled persons organisation, a DPO, and a National Women's Alliance member. And you represent girls, 
women, feminine identi identifying and non-binary people with all types of disability in Australia. The key purpose of WIDA is to promote and advance the human rights and freedoms of women, girls, feminine identifying and non-binary people with disability. WIDA uses the term women and girls with disability on this understanding that this term is inclusive of, supportive of women and girls with disability, along with feminine identifying and non-binary people with disability in Australia. WIDA's goal is to be a national voice for the rights of women and girls with disability and a national force to improve the safety, lives, life chances of women and girls with disability. You represent more than 2 million disabled women, girls, feminine identifying and non-binary people in Australia. You have affiliate organisations and networks of women with disability in most states and territories in Australia. And you're also internationally recognised for your global leadership in advancing the human rights of women and girls with disability. And as a DPO, WIDA is managed and run by women with disability for women and girls with disability. I hope that gives um, the commissioners and those following uh, this session a sense of what you do and your reach. Now, I was going to start with some formal introductions and it might be helpful for the commissioners and those following to know from each of you a little bit about what your role is at WIDA. It doesn't have to be long. Uh, Ms. Ramada, we have met you in public hearing 17.1 back in October, and you and Linda Steele spoke to us about sexual violence, but really looking at issues concerning sexual and reproductive rights for women and girls with disability. So a warm welcome back to you. Thank you. This time we're in person. I said to you, I can't promise that the fire alarm won't go off again. <laughs> but you won't have to walk down 16 flights of stairs that Dr. Steele had to do yes. mid-hearing and still managed to be on the line and yes. engaged in giving evidence while that was happening. Mm. So um, shall we use first names? Yes, please. Okay. So Caroline, over to you. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for having us. Uh, this is an extraordinary opportunity for us. Um, my, I have been the executive director of WIDA for nearly 25 years um, and so uh, there was a, a lot of that 25 years where I was it, um, had no staff. Um, now I feel a little bit spoiled because we have a few staff which is um, fantastic. But yes, so that's my role. Marley? Yes, hello, thank you for having me as well. My name is Marley Hermans and I am a policy and project officer at WIDA. So that means that I work across both some of our projects that are targeted towards our members, including the WIDA Lead Project, as well as in our policy work, um, particularly as a newly established and funded National Women's Alliance by the federal government. Thank you, Tess. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm Tess Moody. Um, I'm a fairly recent addition to WIDA but feel like I've been here for 10 years already because it just feels so wonderful to be part of the organisation. I'm also a policy and project officer, predominantly working on our disability Royal Commission work and engagement, but more recently pitching in and helping out with the Women's Alliance work. Thank you. So, yeah. You wanted to start before we uh, have the discussion to give an acknowledgement of country. Who would like to do that? Uh, yes, yes. Um, so before we begin, um, WIDA would like to acknowledge the Muanina peoples of the Nuanani nation of Truwana Luchawida, the traditional owners and custodians of Napalana, the land upon which we're meeting today. We pay our respects to the ancestors and the elders of this place, both past and present. And we also acknowledge and pay our respects to any First Nations people appearing at this hearing and to those who may be joining through the live stream. Violence against women with disability will never be fully addressed in this place without first reckoning with systemic racism and ongoing colonial oppression. WIDA will always stand in solidarity with First Nations women with disabilities. 
Today, every WIDA staff member providing evidence to the Royal Commission is also a victim survivor of gender-based violence. Like many of our colleagues who work in advocacy or the gender-based violence sector, we know that embedding our lived experience in prevention, early intervention and responses to gender-based violence is vital to ensuring the principle of nothing about us without us. We acknowledge past advocates, activists and change makers who have come before us, including WIDA's founders, and those who continue to tirelessly work towards ensuring women, girls, feminine identifying and non-binary people with disabilities can live their lives free from violence. In acknowledgement of Trans Day of Visibility today, we draw particular attention to and celebrate the leadership of trans disabled people and that leadership that they continue to demonstrate in our community. Finally, WIDA extends our respect to the many women, girls, and gender diverse people with disability who have lost their lives as a result of violence and to those who continue to live with lifelong impairments as a direct result of the violence perpetrated against them. Sitting in front of me right now is a photo of my mum, Julie. My mum was a victim survivor, having experienced multiple intersecting and ongoing forms of violence throughout her life in a range of settings, including hospitals and a disability group home. My mum was murdered by a healthcare system that decided her life as a disabled woman had no value. Those who perpetrated this violence took away her right to speak as they do every day to countless other women and girls with disability. The elders and mentors around me have always taught me to bring a human face to our advocacy and struggles for justice. Today, as we sit in what can often be a cold and clinical setting, let my mum, Julie, serve as that human face. Tess, Carolyn and I are not alone as we sit here today at this bench because we carry with us my mum's memory and the memory of every other disabled victim survivor in here with us. Thank you, Mali. Uh, condolences for your loss. We've heard this week about the strength of mothers, grandmothers, sisters, and as Commissioner Mason said yesterday, that notion of sisterhood doesn't necessarily have to be the blood sisters, but it can be the unity that women bring to supporting each other. So uh, welcome, Julie, and I'm very pleased your mum has joined you on the panel in spirit and that we have also can see her. So thank you, Molly, for that. I want to start by asking you about WIDA's work and advocacy that's relevant to this hearing. Our focus on this hearing is women and girls who experience violence and abuse in family, domestic settings and also sexual violence. WIDA's uh, work extends into a wide range of areas touching on women and girls, but this hearing has got a particular focus. So Caroline, would you like to speak briefly about the history of WIDA's work advocating for the rights of women and girls with disability to be safe from all forms of violence? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, I'm conscious that we don't have a lot of time. We have a lot of things to get through. Um, so um, I wanted to speak somewhat briefly to this. I guess um, for those who don't know much about our organisation, we were formally incorporated in 1995, but operated as an unfunded network within a, uh, a then national uh, peak disability organisation. Um, one of the reasons um, that our organisation came to be was because um, back in those times, the uh, most of the peak disability organisations were run by men and uh, the issues that women with disability wanted to speak about were ignored um, and trivialised. So um, initially, we just started off as just a very small group of 
um, disabled women who came together to give each other support. Um, and we have grown a very lot mm. um, bigger since then. Um, but even back then, um, the right to live free from all forms of violence and, um, and to sexual and uh, reproductive rights were the two most pressing, pressing issues that women with disability wanted to speak about and wanted to be on the agenda. Um, and unfortunately, um, things haven't really changed. Mm. It doesn't, um, so um, it doesn't matter how many times we ask our members to identify their priority issues. It doesn't matter the ways we ask the questions, um, how we ask the questions. The right to live free from all forms of violence is always the priority issue. And sexual and reproductive rights and freedoms comes pretty close uh, with that. I think it's outside the scope of this hearing to talk about all the work that WIDA has done over a very long time um, in this space. Um, I think, you know, our organisation has undertaken research, you know, published books. Um, um, we have written more submissions <laughs> um, uh, than I would ever, ever be able to, to count to, uh, to governments, to, um, you know, uh, regulatory bodies to um, parliamentary inquiries. We've given evidence at, as witnesses to, um, uh, you know, parliamentary and Senate inquiries. Um, uh, we've fought, actually, um, to be included in national uh, advisory structures on disability rights and also on uh, gender equality. Um, and um, I think over the last three decades, we've unapologetically uh, forced our way into the mainstream women's movement and also to be better recognised within the disability rights movement as well. Um, we have fought for over our uh, history um, for, and we continue to fight um, for basic recognition, rights and respect. Um, so we're accredited with the United Nations. Um, we have special consultative status, which means that we can actually engage and support the work of the United Nations um, in this space as well. We've undertaken an, a lot of uh, critically acclaimed national projects and also international projects. We've won national awards um, for our work in uh, preventing, working to prevent violence against women and girls with disability. Um, we've provided a number of detailed, evidence-based, very rigorous submissions to this uh, Dis Disability Royal Commission you, you have. And, um, and we'll be providing more. And I also need to say that we will also be providing submissions where there are no issues papers. Mm. Um, and, and one that we are close to finalising is specifically on sexual and reproductive rights. Um, so... I think um, that it's critical that, that this Royal Commission, a once in a lifetime opportunity that many of us and many who came before us have fought for mm. over a long time, um, understands fundamentally that violence against us doesn't stop at the door. Um, and this brings us to the scope of this hearing. Mm. Whilst I understand that the focus is on uh, family, domestic um, and sexual violence, there are um, some very important things we need to say up front. So first of all, how do we define domestic settings? Mm -hmm. um, how do we define, family, uh, define family? How do we define family violence in the context of women and girls with disability? So is a domestic setting understood as, um, is, as a house with a door? Um, is family understood as family of origin or family of choice? Um, is domestic and family violence understood to mean violence between uh, essentially spousal and or intimate partners? Can I jump in there? Because that's a topic that I want, want to ask you about <coughs> as, we, as we go on in looking at some yes, of those definitions. Exactly. So I'm and, going to skip yeah. through there because yeah. uh, I've just about to say we're going to speak about that more. <laughs> yeah. But I think I need to make it very clear um, that for many of us, uh, 
our domestic setting can indeed be a, a typical home mm. with a door, <laughs> uh, but it can also be a group home, uh, a licensed or unlicensed boarding house, a hostel, um, a prison, a, a tent, a semi-supported accommodation facility, a respite centre, aged care facility, hospital, just mm. to name a few. But it can also be the street. It can be a park bench. So um, I think that uh, we... Um, we will talk later about uh, the many forms of gender-based violence we experience. Um, uh, and so um, I hope that that gives a bit of a sense mm. of um, how our organisation uh, perceives um, family and domestic mm. violence. So uh, very so we've got to take a broad approach and we have to really think about where women will be and where there is that risk in terms of sexual violence or family and domestic violence. Yeah, and violence against women, um, girls, uh, should never depend on where they live. Yeah. Ever. Um, it, violence against women and girls is violence against women and girls. And, and to put a hierarchy on forms of violence um, in the context of women and girls with disabilities is, is problematic. But I want to turn to human rights and particularly drawing on international human rights conventions. Mm -hmm. As you're aware, the Royal Commission conducted its public year 18, and that was to examine how the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the CRPD, mm -hmm. are applied in Australia. How is it implemented? And how important it is to have those human rights frameworks in in our thinking around policy, development of laws and practice. So the CRPD does make reference to women and girls with disability. And there's also a general comment published by mm -hmm. the committee. The Royal Commissioners have heard about the concept of cross-cutting articles in the CRPD, but your work is not limited to the CRPD. And you've, you've shown that we need to look at a, a suite of human rights. When we're talking about women and girls, it's also drawing on the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, mm -hmm. but also looking at other, what might be called the mainstream conventions. So the, well, you know, torture convention. Caroline, do you to want interrupt? to talk about, yeah? Oh, okay. Go. <laughs> you can ask the questions today, we'll swap. <laughs> but, but, I, but my question for yeah. you is, Taking a human rights approach, how does WIDA incorporate a human rights approach into your work? But what should we be looking at when we think about uh, analysing and thinking about policies and practices in Australia? Um, okay, so um, when we talk about, well, first of all, as you know, Australia is a signatory to seven international human rights treaties and also um, has endorsed the Declaration on the Rights mm -hmm. of uh, Indigenous Peoples in 2009. Um, it, uh, those, those international human rights treaties that we are a party to are not meant to be viewed in isolation. Mm. They're actually meant to be uh, looked at and considered as a suite, um, a holistic uh, package, if you I think like. sometimes the international law language is interdependent, interrelated and indivisible. That's so we right. hear that language in international law. So then, and um, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, so each one of these international human rights treaties that we are a signatory to or a party to, um, each of them have obligations um, on Australia to around reducing gender-based violence and also promoting disability rights. And so... Um, and the concluding observations that come from the monitoring of, of Australia's performance under those international human rights treaties that we're a party to, um, there is an expectation that they are to be implemented. So um, in, in the domestic setting. And so, um, you know, it, it's like, um, that, as I said, there, those recommendations 
are expected to be implemented. So I want to give just an example of, I know that this um, Royal Commission is framed essentially by the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, and that's critically important. It is an international human rights, um, uh, intersectional human rights treaty. But for example, six out of the seven uh, treaty monitoring bodies of the seven treaties that we're signatory to, for the last 18 years have made very clear and specific recommendations to us successive Australian governments about the need to enact national law to prohibit forced sterilisation. Um, I could, you know, go on about that, but I won't. And so, um, so it's not just the CRPD. Of course, that monitoring body has made that recommendation many times, mm. but the committee um, that oversees the, the Convention Against Torture, I'll just use the short mm. term if that's all right, mm. yeah, that's um, uh, has made, again, very strong recommendations around this. Um, and so it's not just about looking at the CRPD mm. and what it says uh, we need to improve on. Mm. It's about looking at the recommendations from all those international human rights treaties um, because, as I said, we have international human rights obligations under all of those seven, um, and hopefully soon the Declaration on the Rights of um, Indigenous Peoples uh, as well. Mm. But is that enough? That is, yeah, oh. that's <laughs> fine. Uh, but I might ask Marley because one of the issues is to understand multi-layered experiences or intersectionality. So I wanted to ask you about how does the human rights approach address intersectionality or a multi-layered experience for women and girls with disability? Yeah, um, I also don't want to get, uh, I guess, too tied up in definitions, but um, I think it is worth defining intersectionality because it is um, quite a common term that's used in mainstream feminist movement and also increasingly in public policy. Mm. Um, and I think that there isn't a consistent understanding of what intersectionality is. Um, so I just wanted to kind of briefly, you know, give a little bit of context that intersectionality was theorised by a black scholar named Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989. Um, and intersectionality it grew out of black feminist voices who'd been making this analysis for decades, if not hundreds of years. Um, and so it's a tool that's used to, I guess, reveal and transform the interconnectedness of the ways that power and oppression work for people. Um, so I know that Crenshaw, when she first um, theorised intersectionality as a concept, said that um, intersectionality reveals the conceptual limitations of single issue analyses. And as you can tell, that's very important for women and girls with disabilities because um, we're not only oppressed on the basis of our gender, but also on the basis of our disability. And for many of us too, on the basis of our race and um, many different other parts of our personhood. Um, so yeah, for women and girls with disabilities, intersectionality is really important because it serves to reveal the really grievous human rights violations that we're subjected to and that um, I'm sure we'll talk more about mm. today, um, not only on the basis of our gender, but on the basis of our disability. Um, so it's a good tool, I guess, to understand how ableism and sexism aren't separate drivers of violence, they actually compound one another. And so um, we often experience gendered ableist violence, which is a different form of violence than say men with disabilities would experience. Um, and the importance of intersectionality as a conceptual framework is that um, I think it challenges the way that Australian law and public policy attempts to really neatly compartmentalise different forms of discrimination like sexism and ableism, rather than recognising the really the complex interplay between systems of oppression and power structures. Um, so again, really critically, intersectional analysis serves to demonstrate compounding oppression for specific communities of women and girls with disabilities. Um, for example, again, um, specific forms of violence that First Nations women with disabilities face in the colony, um, where First Nations women with disabilities are subjected to not only racism and ableism, but sexism as well. And that results in um, very specific forms of violence. So if we look at um, the context of forced sterilization, 
if we look at how forced sterilization has a very um, eugenicist history behind it um, and consider that in the context of Australia as a settler colony, I think intersectionality is a, a quite useful tool to understand that. But um, unfortunately, most states, including Australia, don't recognise or really adequately address at all intersectional discrimination and its aggravating or compounding effects within human rights implementation. So often equality and anti-discrimination laws and provisions categorise identity and require each protected characteristic or each part of your identity or personhood to be dealt with in isolation. So this type of approach, I think um, we can all agree is quite divorced from our own experiences as humans. I can't divorce my gender from my race, from my disability, from any of those aspects of myself. Um, and yeah, in some jurisdictions, for example, victims and survivors of discrimination and violence can only bring a complaint of discrimination with respect to one ground um, because intersectional discrimination is not provided for in the law. So for decades, WIDA has advocated for an intersectional human rights approach, um, urging both the Commonwealth as well as state and territory governments to embed, and I mean embed <laughs> intersectionality, not silo, not have one or two pages on intersectionality, but embed intersectionality within anti-discrimination law um, and all, I guess, legislative implementation of UN human rights treaties and instruments Australia is a signatory to. Um, because as Carolyn touched on before, human rights treaties and instruments like the CRPD, like CEDAW, um, like UNDRIP, they were never designed to be considered in isolation from one another and they need to be viewed and implemented in tandem in order to fully protect um, the rights of cohorts like women and girls with disabilities who, as we are aware, are frequently subjected to violence and abuse based on intersection of experiences of oppression um, and women and girls with disabilities deserve the right to address um, and prevent violence on the basis of these specific forms of violence rather than um, having to choose or prioritise one part of our identity over the other. Okay. Tess, can I ask you that in the case of women and girls with disability who experience violence and abuse in their families or domestic settings, how does a human rights approach help us to understand the causes of violence and abuse? Do you want to take that question? Yeah, sure. So before we talk about the causes or the drivers of violence, we need to really just place responsibility where it predominantly lays, um, and that is with the perpetrator. It's a perpetrator's choice to use violence. Um, when it comes down to the, um, the drivers, understanding these causes and drivers can improve the way that we identify risk and respond to violence. However, this doesn't lessen the abuser's responsibility for their choices. Um, like Marley, Marley said, the main root cause of violence against women, whether they have a disability or not, is gender inequality. Um, and gender equality is a fundamental human rights principle that underpins every major international human rights instrument. Um, gender, gender drivers, I won't go into too much depth, but the gender drivers are mostly condoning of violence against women, the men's control of decision making and limiting women's independence in, in life, um, the rigid gender stereotypes that we see um, in society and the male peer relations and cultures of masculinity that emphasise aggression, dominance or control. And like what Marley said, in addition to gender inequality for women with disability, ableism com compounds this violence against women, but it's also a driver in itself. So it's interconnected, but also can be separate. Um, recently, Our Watch released a resource called Changing the Landscape, um, which WIDA was part of um, consulting and contributing to. And that really unpacks that combination of the, the ableist and the gendered um, inequality drivers. Tess, can I jump in there? That that document is available online. So it if is. people want to have a look at that, they can yep. search that up. It's on our watchers website. Mm. Um, so our ableist drivers are the negative stereotypes about people with disability, accepting or normalizing violence, disrespect and discrimination against people with disabilities 
controlling their decision making, limiting their independence, and also social segregation and exclusion. So segregation in itself facilitates the use of violence, abuse and exploitation as well. So gender inequality and ableism intersect um, and compound to create this landscape in which women and girls with disability um, have violence perpetrated against them. And in some cases, you know, it's lawful or encouraged. So like Carolyn said, in the case of sexual and reproductive violence, restrictive practices and guardianship orders. Um, also, like Marley said, in addition to the gender drivers of um, gender inequality and ableism, intersectionality. So that all intermeshes within that as well. Um, the segregating setting, segregated settings, like Carolyn said, such as group homes, hospitals, prisons, boarding houses, or um, you know, settings on the street, which don't neatly fit into that definition of family or domestic violence or intimate partner violence, that also fosters the environment for the violence to occur. So, in my opinion, that's a driver as well. We need to look more closely at the environment as a driver, not just a setting. Um, often violence in segregated settings is behind closed doors and hidden. Um, so the drivers of violence in those settings, I believe, still remains unaddressed and really quite neglected. Um, when we're talking about human rights, so consistent with the recommendations from several of the human rights treaty monitoring bodies, our Australian government and the state and territories, um, we think that, that should, they should review, amend and repeal laws, policies um, and practices that don't comply with the CRPD. Um, I really think that we can never, you know, prevent specific forms of violence if the law is saying they're acceptable and we continue to have segregated settings that continues to drive that. Um, the United Nations Conventions to which Australia is a signatory recognises that women and girls with disabilities have the same rights, human rights and fundamental freedoms. And Article 6 um, in the UN Convention, the CRPD explicitly um, states that. So overall, I think unless we address that combination of the gender drivers, the ableist drivers, really embed the intersectional lens, like Marley said, not just have a two page document, in major frameworks um, and address the drivers of violence in our lawful settings, then we're really neglecting to comply with human rights conventions. Um, it's absolutely vital that human rights frameworks are embedded across all aspects of primary prevention, um, or I don't think we'll ever fully combat gender-based violence for women and girls mm. with disability. Thank you. I'm going to have to keep an eye on the time because I don't want us to miss out on some of the things I know coming up that we need to talk about. But Marley, can I ask you about restrictive practices as a form of violence and abuse against women and girls in their family or their domestic settings? Um, yeah, of course. So I guess, again, I want to come back to definitions. So I know the Royal Commission defines restrictive practices as any action, approach or intervention that has the effect of limiting the rights or freedom of movement of a person. Um, and then this is very similar to how the NDIS defines restrictive practices. Um, however, um, the way that WIDA conceptualizes restrictive practices is a lot broader and extends to interventions that are exclusively or primarily perpetrated on women and girls with disability. Um, so the type of restrictive practices that I'm talking about include non-consensual and co coercive sterilization, menstrual suppression, um, forced use of contraception and forced abortion, um, the forced removal of children, denial of support for sexual activity and denial of support for intimate relationships. Um, I also want to be clear that we're also assuming um, that restrictive practices include the non-consensual and coercive use of psychotropic medication. So even if this medication is prescribed by a medical practitioner for a diagnosed mental health condition, um, we do know that um, psychotropic medications are regularly used as restrictive practices to control the behaviour of women and girls with disability. Um, yeah, what, in whatever context, setting, reason for use, 
um, committed of very strong beliefs that restrictive practices are violent and are in violation of human rights. Um, I think there are a multiple conceptual levels on which restrictive practices should be understood as a form of violence. Um, so on one level, on the, I guess, very interpersonal level, the use of restrictive practices is a form of interpersonal violence against women and girls with disability um, because they're often non-consensual and they're coercive interventions perpetrated by an individual, like a split support worker, onto another individual um, that causes harm, takes away that person's autonomy, takes away that person's decision-making, um, and often, yeah, causes long-term and ongoing trauma. Um, but most importantly, restrictive practices need to be understood on the structural level. And I think this is what WIDA has been advocating for a very long time, is that restrictive practices need to be understood as gendered ableist violence. Um, and that understanding of ableism is really central to understanding restrictive practices um, because I want to be really clear, the use of restrictive practices, it's not just simply about stigma um, or negative feeling towards people with disability. Um, restrictive practices are part of a really larger project of maintaining um, specific hierarchies between able-bodied people and disabled people. Um, we know as well that the use of restrictive practices um, is very severe and very commonplace in institutional and segregated settings. So coming back to that definition of family and domestic settings, that's why WIDA thinks it's really important to be considering places like disability group homes, prisons, psychiatric wards, hospitals, um, because we know in these settings, restrictive practices are often used with ambivalence every single day for organisational reasons. Um, restrictive practices are factored into how, for instance, disability group homes work and operate um, because they make it easier for support workers. Can I just um, jump in there? Because I think this links very closely to the question that I was going to ask Caroline next, which is Wooda's view about closed settings and about the optional protocol on the Convention Against Torture, the, the OPCAT as it's called. And when we're talking about closed settings, you would look at group homes as a form of closed setting. What's Widder's view about OPCAT and uh, whether you think that would make a difference for women and girls with disability in closed settings who experience violence and abuse? Um, absolutely. I think uh, one of the first comments I'd make is about um, the Australian government's uh, apathy towards um, uh, its uh, obligations under OPCAT. Um, the, we still have, um, you know, OPCAT, being a signatory to OPCAT means that, um, that, it, it, that we, we require what's called national preventive mechanisms. So at a, at a Commonwealth le federal level, but also by each state and territory um, government to be established. OPCAT, um, it is clear from the text of OPCAT and Article 4.1 of the Convention Against Torture that, um, that it's about um, being able to uh, visit, in, monitor, review, uh, any setting where someone is deprived of their liberty, as in can't leave. Now, unfortunately, um, the, uh, the national preventive mechanism at a Commonwealth level, it, the coordinating point is the Commonwealth Ombudsman. Um, and it is very regrettable that uh, we still have some uh, states and territories who are yet to uh, even work out how their national mm. preventive mechanism is going to operate. I'm not an expert on where everything is up to no, at the no, moment. No, I think my question was really uh, reflecting that you take a very broad approach and you encourage a broad approach in understanding domestic 
and family settings, but particularly domestic settings, as you've said at the beginning. And so if we look at these requirements of the OPCAP, which is the opportunity to go in and visit and see what's going on and respond to and it's allegations. And it's meant to be a, meant to be a, a proactive yeah. process, not a reactive yeah. process. It's a very important safeguarding um, process. But you, you would like to see... Um, the principles of OBCAT apply in Australia, but also have a gender lens to them so yes. that uh, incidents of violence and abuse for women with disability in closed settings is going to be picked up. Is that? Yeah, absolutely. That and it, it is very um, disappointing um, to see that uh, the uh, Commonwealth Ombudsman, the National Preventive Mechanism, um, has, or the Australian government, sorry, has. Um, only uh, agreed to um, to allow OPCAT to operate in what's called primary places of detention, traditionally like prisons and um, settings like that. Whereas from the consultation report and the Australian Human Rights uh, Commission report released in 2020, that was a result of widespread consultation on the implementation of OPCAT in Australia, it was very, very clear that disability settings um, it must be included, disability specific and mainstream settings where people with disability are, are often uh, deprived of their liberty. So, um, and that is the position of the states and territories at the moment who are um, setting up their, so there, there'll be no aged care. Um, so residential aged care is not included, group homes, um, other forms of uh, segregated and closed settings. Um, and uh, I think that's really disappointing. So you want to sort of see a broader view taken in terms of what the settings are to which the... Well, it is an obligation under the yeah. CRPD yeah. and it has been in Australia's 2019 review under the CRPD, yeah. it was specifically mentioned. The other thing is that um, I would like to say quite strongly is that um, there is a national advisory uh, group, that committee that is set up, has been set up to advise on the implementation of OPCAT in Australia. It is very regrettable that there is no disability representation at all on that advisory group. And again, um, that's in breach of, um, you know, uh, Article 4 and 33 of, uh, of the CRPD. So um, that's a real problem because we have a right to be able to participate and be engaged in decisions um, about our lives. And so even in those primary places of detention, there is over-representation of, of people with disability anyway. So is, is that is that answered your question? Yes, that certainly enough? has answered my question. I want to move now to where there are gaps in legal protections for rights of women and girls with disability in Australian laws. And I mentioned in opening on Monday, the work the Royal Commission's done with an issues paper on violence and abuse of people with disability at home. And we've recently published earlier in March, the responses. And WIDA provided a submission to the Royal Commission in response to the issues paper and you identified a lack of consistent legal definition of violence against women and girls in state and territory legislation. And that then led to a, a varying degree of protection. We um, spoke about this at the beginning of this public hearing back in October, and you might recall Jacoba Brash, the then president of the Law Council, spoke about those definitions. And Ms Ryan took us through the sort of hypothetical case of Lily depending on where she lived, uh, what her protections might be. So um, I don't think we need to go back and sort of cover the same things that we did in October, but in terms of what WIDA has been working on, I'm listening to women and girls with disability. Uh, you've called for the development of national legislation on gender-based violence against women. So Caroline, can I ask about that, but also at the same time is where can we look to in terms of other countries yep. that have got an appropriate and comprehensive definition of domestic and family violence that may be something the Royal Commission might want to consider in terms of uh, different models. Can I can I do those two questions in one? I'll try. Because I'm yep. conscious of the, of the time. time. Okay. Um, well, first of all, uh, yes, we, we, we 
we have argued for a very long time about the development of national legislation on gender-based violence because if you think about it, we have eight different um, you mm. know, states and territories who define uh, domestic family violence in different ways uh, under, and again, I'm not... Um, I'm not, asking you to your, be, I'm not um, asking you to be a lawyer on thank this. You. It's really <laughs> just the importance of the protection. I know I always so, say that to you. Um, yep. So, the, um, I mean, it is absurd when you think of it that in Australia, you know, gender-based violence perpetrated against women with a disability in Tasmania may be completely differently conceptualised mm. in law in New South Wales. We have... Um, inconsistent definitions, uh, we don't even have a national agreed definition of what constitutes gender-based violence uh, against women. And the reason um, that I say that is because uh, the forms of violence we experience um, are excluded in law in these acts many times. Um, and, um, and we're just... Uh, and so why should somebody get a certain amount of protection in one state or territory but not somewhere else? Would you like to sort of see a national consistent definition? Yes, so but I think the there's other... a mechanism for oh, doing sorry. that. Sorry, I've done it again. I interrupted you. That's all right. Sorry. Uh, um, I'm yes. going to do protective interrupting so we can get to everything. But, but now, in, um, we are a signatory to CEDAW, mm -hmm. and in um, 2018, uh, under Australian's review, uh, around our compliance. CEDAW has been calling for Australia to establish a national law on gender-based violence for a very long time. And, um, and in 2017, the CEDAW committee published a general comment, mm. a general recommendation 35 um, to, uh, to update the thinking around uh, violence against women and have um, given very clear authoritative guidance to states' parties on what uh, needs to happen and what we need to. So there are. Um, so we need we need a consistent national national definition that in, that in, incorporates us that includes the forms of violence that we uh, that we experience and are at much higher risk of. So um, I know you asked about other countries. So. Um, it is, uh, I wanted to point out just a couple of things. So the Istanbul Convention, um, which is uh, um, 45 uh, European mm -hmm. uh, countries of, uh, are signatory to that. Now, one of the things about the Istanbul Convention is that it does actually name up mm -hmm. things like forced sterilisation, um, you know, sexual slavery, um, other forms of, uh, you know, gender-based violence. Um, the South African legislation, um, there were three new bills introduced uh, only a couple of weeks ago. It's not only about the definition, it's mm. about the implementation. Mm. So, for example, the new law, uh, South African law, um, has provision within it to, for example, to be able to apply for an apprehended violence order 24 hours a day online. Mm. Um, so it's not just the definitions. Um, and the other thing is that uh, if we look at the United States um, Violence Against Women uh, Reauthorisation Act mm. that, again, was only signed off mm. a couple of weeks ago, one of the things that, and I'm not saying it's perfect by any mm. means, but one of the things that that does um, is that it mandates things. Mm. So it mandates training of judges and, you know, people who work in all sorts of fields. It mandates uh in Native um, American women's rights. It, um, it mandates grants programs. Um, and so uh, it's a five-year um, act. Uh, but for those five years, it's, I mean, there's a lot of things in it that I think we could learn mm. from. And again, I'm not saying it's great. Mm. The best one I would say is probably the Istanbul Convention. So if we could look look to some but of the general comments, general yep. recommendation 35, mm. CEDAW, of which we're a signatory to, mm. um, clearly spells out what the definitions mm. and 
updates the thinking around what we mean by gender-based violence against women. Mm. And it includes things like our sexual and reproductive rights. It includes women with disability. It, it, so the definition's actually there. Mm. Um, and so, uh, um, yeah, so, I, and, and I guess the other thing, and it might be, well, I also wanted to say that how... Um, having national legislation is also about leadership. It's about this country saying this is what we agree is gender-based violence against women and this is what we're going to do about it. Um, it is ridiculous to think that we have eight different definitions and of what constitutes a relationship and what constitutes... And then um, we also have... Uh, and then at the Commonwealth level, we've got... A definition in the Family Law Act, mm -hmm. and that's so, it. So it's part of getting a national approach, but integrated in the sense that just sort of having a legal definition might not be enough. But how you support uh, the protection of women, which is, as you said, training, awareness, funding, all of those elements yes. that go into it. Yes. Right. Okay, I'm going to keep going. I've got to be tough on the time. <laughs> Sorry. Um, one I talk too much. <laughs> one issue is that. Uh, Widows raise concerns about lawful forms of violence. And, you know, Rosemary Caius has also spoken to us about lawful violence and the law sometimes is a tool of violence. This might arise in the context of guardianship for sterilisation and substituted decision-making. I think, as you know, we're planning on having yeah. a hearing later this year, looking specifically at the issues of guardianship and substituted decision-making. Did you want to say something? I'm really going to go and briefly I, on, on that okay. topic. Because, and I'll answer as briefly mm. as I can, because, to be honest, we could do a whole hearing on that. We, well, we are. <laughs> not just, <laughs> I think so. Um, yeah. Not just, yeah. on, but, you know, the lawful forms of violence. Yeah. Now, um, how is it okay how is it okay that we live in a wealthy country like Australia and it is still lawful to sterilise our young um, girls with disability and our adult women with disability without their full prior and informed consent? How is that okay? And we did talk about that. Yep, back so in that's October, right. So it's not so just that, forced yep. sterilisation. How is it okay that in a wealthy country like Australia we can forcibly um, make women with disability and girls with disability take contraception and often injectable contraceptives that in some other countries have been banned years ago. Um, how is it okay that we see our First Nations uh, um, women with disability um, indefinitely detained without, con without conviction? Um, how is it okay that women with disability don't, aren't allowed to have legal capacity? Mm -hmm. Um, so I could go on and on and on about this for an eternity, but it is Australia's shame that um, to think that, uh, as I said, it's 17 years now that every one of those treaty monitoring mm. bodies, including the Convention Against Torture, the Committee Against Torture, mm. has said, stop it. Mm. You cannot sterilise. Stop the menstrual suppression. Stop the forced contraception. Stop the segregation until this country is prepared to address segregation, seeing people with disabilities as other, um, then we will never, ever stop this epidemic mm. that is violence and abuse against women and girls with disability. I'm sorry. Is that too, is that too much? No. Right. Okay. Law is one thing. Policies and strategies yep. is another area. And uh, we've seen last year in December the release of Australia's disability mm -hmm. strategy, a draft national plan to end violence against women and girls to replace the current plan. Uh, Caroline, and uh, you might, if you want to share this with the others, it's up, up to you, but have the national policy approaches to address addressing the experience of women and girls with disability been based on a shared understanding of what constitutes violence against women? I think based on what you've said earlier, all of you are shaking I can your head. I think the answer, answer that, that really might be quickly no. for you because yeah. no. And how can they when we can't even agree as a country 
on what it is. Mm -hmm. um, so if we don't have nationally agreed definitions and, and conceptual understandings, how policy frameworks, and this is why national legislation is so important mm -hmm. because it's, it's the legislation that sets the scope of policy mm -hmm. frameworks that then set the scope of funding and service responses. And it's, mm -hmm. it's that trickle down stuff. So if we look at um, just things like um, uh, in the previous national plan, and I would say that we have worked very, very hard on the new draft of mm. the national plan to reduce violence against mm. women and children, but um, that is not yet uh, released or mm. um, still in the drafting stage, right. isn't it? Yes. yes. But in terms of Australia's disability strategy, we did the same thing there. We were very upset that we weren't able to get a standalone outcome area mm. on safety and um, safety from all forms of violence. And it is problematic that we still don't have ways of even measuring properly. Um, uh, you know, how can you measure something when you don't mm. even ha have an understanding or an agreement on what it is? Mm. So, and the other thing I wanted to say is, um, it is from my experience, having been in this job for 25 years, that, um, that these policy frameworks um, that you talk about um, have largely focused on intimate partner and spousal mm. violence. And even if we look at things like perpetrator intervention programs, I, I defy anyone to find me uh, a perpetrator intervention program that actually includes and focuses on the perpetrators of the violence that we experience, mm. or the other, sorry, the other forms mm. of violence. So perpetrator intervention programs are largely focused on, you know, the intimate partner yeah. relationship. So we get excluded in many, in, in so many ways um, because uh, it's not it's not well understood. The multiple forms of violence that we experience are not well understood. Mm. Um, and so, yes, we, we're often excluded. So, and again, how can you have something, you know, national frameworks that aim to uh, reduce, um, you know, violence, gender-based violence against women when you have laws that actually allow it? Mm. <laughs> so, so, so sorts of issues of aligning the laws and policies together but I, I think the clear message I'm understanding today is not to have narrow definitions that then will exclude disability, uh, women with, and girls with disability, because they're outside those sort of mainstream senses of what relationships are for family or domestic settings. Is that right? Yeah. And I think even something like um, a forced and coerced marriage, mm. now typically in Australia that's understood to occur in faith-based communities, mm. when in fact that is a big issue um, for some women with disability. Um, and so, but it's never, there's no research, there's no interest. Um, so we have so far to go. And um, so, yeah, I hope that's answered your question Yes, a it bit. definitely has. So I, you know, I'm just going to look at our timetable and say I'm going to press on for another 15 minutes or so. I think we've got a little bit of time, but I'll just check with those this is in just to let others know that we might go on a little bit more. Um, I want to come back to Marley and to Tess and yeah. turn our attention to the NDIS. And one of the issues which has come up for you in the work that you do and the women and girls who you engage with is uh, an effective gender strategy within the NDIS. And so there is a, a concern uh, from WIDA that there's not an effective gender strategy. Marley, do you want to take that question and, um, and tell us what the nature of the concern is and what needs to be done? Yeah, of course. Um, I might be a little bit cheeky and actually say, not only is there not an effective gender strategy, there actually is no gender strategy at all. Right. <laughs> um, so I want to make that very okay, clear. Okay, so starting point is yeah. a, gender, a, a exactly. gender strategy, and then secondly, you want it to be an effective strategy if it was there. Okay. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, we know, I think, um, the most recent participation rates in the NDIS um, that are released by the NDIA, um, it was 30%. Oh, 37%, sorry, of all participants were women and girls. Um, absolutely no data on the participation rates of trans or gender diverse people as well, which is important to point out. Um, 
and there are heaps of reasons for this. So we know that women and girls with disabilities are often socialised and encouraged not to speak up for the support that we need. Um, different diagnosis processes. So for instance, for women and girls um, who are autistic, we know that they are way less likely to be diagnosed, therefore to be able to apply to the NDIS. Um, and then there are lots of different types of disabilities and chronic illnesses that um, predominantly women experience compared to rates and men. And these are the types of disabilities that the NDIS doesn't consider. Um, so all of these things kind of compound each other and um, ultimately, you know, kind of enforce this gender inequity mm. within the scheme. So what would a, a gender strategy look like for the NDIS? Has Widow uh, thought about that? Yeah, so we have. We think about it every day. <laughs> um, so I think it's a gender strategy. Um, it needs to include mechanisms to ensure that the processes um, <laughs> to both access the NDIS as well as maintain funding, um, they're accessible to women and girls with disability and that they are sensitive to the fact that many of us have experienced different forms of trauma. Um, so, you know, for many women with intellectual disabilities, cognitive impairment, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women in particular, <coughs> there's a really specific risk of trauma associated with telling, for instance, a local area coordinator your story. Um, so that needs to be part of an effective gender strategy for the NDIS. Um, and there also needs to be some really clear supports related to health, in particular reproductive and sexual health for women and girls with disability. Um, because too often women and girls with disability were denied our right to sexual expression um, and were denied our right to bodily autonomy based on really ableist attitudes about disabled women being either hypersexual or asexual. Um, and again, coming back to that human rights frame, the CRPD has said over and over again that women and girls with disability have a right to access services equally to everybody else. Um, but unfortunately that's not the case because the NDIS has not prioritized a gender strategy and hasn't seen it as important, which is really concerning considering the importance of implementing a really effective gender strategy to address things like gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. well, I think uh, we've got some representatives of the NDIA uh, coming to give some evidence tomorrow. So that's a question I've asked them to think about. Um, we'll explore that with them tomorrow. Tess, can I ask you about what Widow has heard about screening processes for violence in the NDIS and uh, are there processes or assessments in place for support workers or even for NDIA staff? so that one might identify the issue. You were here in the hearing room when Nicole Lee spoke about this on Monday. Can I, uh, that's a huge topic. <laughs> it's huge <laughs> and you, I've cut down what I've written to her. Can we just, um, <laughs> I, I think in some senses, could I ask you, and I know you've got some notes there, but it's really what having listened to Nicole Lee's evidence and what you've heard during the week. I mean, what needs to be done in terms mm. of this screening process in terms of yeah. how widow has obviously heard a lot yeah. of stories uh, from women yeah. on this. What needs to be done on the screen? Yeah. Well, NDIS workers and staff, they're in prime positions to be able to identify when women with disabilities are experiencing violence. But we don't believe that they're currently equipped to do this um, effectively or properly. There are no, at the moment, substantial um, screening processes or assessment tools um, in place for them to use to be able to detect that. Um, a standard question, you know, by an NDIS worker of, are you experiencing domestic or family violence, might not be useful for women with disabilities because our experiences of violence are so broad, diverse, complex and in different settings. Um, and those sort of questions might not identify the more hidden forms like coercive control, um, all the restrictive practices um, or um, things like, you know, restricting food or neglecting care. Um, so we really think at WIDA that it's important that there's a regular routine screening process um, to detect this. 
uh, whether that's during the application process, um, whether it's um, during planning meetings or coordination of supports or service provision or plan review meetings. So at any mm. stage in that NDIS um, process. So we recommend the development and implementation of an NDIS violence assessment and response framework and or toolkit. Mm. Um, and that would encompass what I think should look like identify, respond and refer. Mm. So going across all the levels. Um, it can also, we, we feel strongly that if that framework and toolkit's going to be developed, it has to be with women with disabilities. So, you know, in co-design, mm. they're not just making it for us and think that they know it's going to be okay. We scream about that all the time at WIDA, don't make it for us, do it with us. Um, and that toolkit needs to have mm. that intersectional lens as well. Um, when the development of the assessment toolkit is done, uh, we feel that that should be made mandatory for NDIS workers and appropriate training, like comprehensive training, not just an online module you go through at, you know, one hour at the end of your day, um, something that's really comprehensive. Um, we also think that um, also along with the, you know, the mandatory appropriate training, is that we would like some consideration to be given to the establishment of a dedicated NDIS specialist disability um, gender-based violence assessment mm -hmm. team who can do that as well. Um, and overarching the toolkit um, and the assessment tool, like Marley said, we need the gender equity strategy mm -hmm. that's, that's, yeah, overarching. So again, that integration, that yeah. gender uh, strategy would also identify what screening tools might need to Absolutely. be. Absolutely. So that's part of the whole process. It just doesn't, the, the assessment and toolkit shouldn't just sit as a, just this separate thing by itself. It needs yeah. to be addressed. The whole NDIS needs to have a gendered lens. And Marley, this fits into, I think, the question you were going to take, which is about the uh, NDIS providing or the NDIA probably providing accessible information and resources to women participants about violence, so they can access assistance if and when required. Uh, what would you like to say about um, what needs to be done in terms of information and resources? Yeah, so um, to date, to our knowledge, we haven't heard of anything being offered by the NDIS. Um, in regards to women participants about violence. Um, and we would hope that this would be something that would be covered by a really effective NDIS gender strategy. Um, like Tess said, um, any type of accessible information and resources needs to be co-designed from the start mm -hmm. with women and girls with disability and their representative organisations. Um, and WIDA actually has some incredibly useful, award-winning, groundbreaking um, resources on safety and violence, including our site, um, which is a website that people can visit, mm. that NDIS local area coordinators, for instance, could be promoting to their participants. There's also the 1800 Respect Sunny app, which is mm -hmm. similarly co-designed by and for women and girls with disability. And these are the types of resources um, that speak to our community because of the types of resources that actually reflect our stories mm. um, and reflect our experiences. Mm. Um, and I think one final part of the puzzle here is not just creating these accessible resources and information. There needs to be better integration between the NDIS and specialist women's services because there needs to be really clear pathways for mm. referrals. Um, and yeah, the responsibility there is on the NDIS to be creating those pathways and um, understanding that addressing violence experienced by um, women participants in the scheme, particularly from NDIS service providers, is the responsibility of the NDIS. Um, and therefore, there is a responsibility to be able to not only give women with disabilities information on their rights on violence, but also to be able to effectively refer them on to those specialist services. Thank you. Caroline, I was going to finish by asking you about the 26 recommendations <laughs> in the in Witter's um, submission to the Royal Commission's <laughs> Issues Paper. Uh, 
a, if you're agreeable to uh, the Royal Commission publishing that part of the paper, if we haven't already done so, those they're very strong and integrated recommendations. So I'm just sort of mindful of the time that I'm not going to do justice to asking you about all of those recommendations today. But any final words from you? And we'll make sure that um, we can share with your permission the yes, recommendations that you've made. Absolutely. So any, any final words? And then yes. I can see the chair's giving me a look as if to move it on. But um, I will. Be but, uh, because the chair is his usual benign self. Mm. Uh, we we can see you very acutely, <laughs> but uh, but I'm conscious just that the commissioners say, might have some questions. Yes, that so pick up um, themes I haven't covered. I guess um, as a final comment, and that'd be great if you could make those recommendations available. I would like to say as a as a final comment, I think, is that um, we can't. There's no such thing as a little bit of human rights. You can't cherry pick. Um, you can't say, oh, well, we'll have that one, but not that one. Um, as I said before, we have the, the framework in terms of the treaty, um, the treaties, their general comments, mm -hmm. their recommendations, our concluding observations, all those sorts of things. And that provides the framework for us, um, you know, to have a holistic uh, response. So I think it's, um, you know, we just quickly, we want to see repeal of laws. We want that enable lawful mm. forms of violence. We need to see an end of segregation in all its forms. And we need a transition plan. I'm not saying do it overnight. Mm. Um, but, you know, we need that. Um, and one thing that has... Uh, I would like to just quickly say, because it's come up in every hearing almost, is the critical role of independent advocacy. It is, um, you know, there is, it is under-resourced. Um, the model's not great. Uh, the funding model's not great. Um, and I think that that seems to have come through. I don't know if that's mm. your impression, but it's certainly something that I think you know, we really need to um, see uh, much more focus on. Could I, I, I will say, uh, commissioners may be aware that um, this hearing has taken us almost a year to prepare. We've had the stops and starts initially, hoping to have this hearing in August, then October, and we start a little bit on October and we're finally here. We're indebted to widow's advice and consultations with us along the way suggestions for witnesses. And uh, it's been uh, a privilege to collaborate with you and for the assistance that you've given us to ensure that the rights of women and girls with disability who experience family and domestic violence can be heard, that we hear directly from women, but also for the support in bringing these threads together to help us understand what needs to happen in the areas of law and policy reform. And just reminding us of the importance of taking a strong human rights approach and how we do that. So I know that we could probably talk all day, but our discussions will continue not only in the hearing rooms, but outside the hearing rooms. And I wanted to thank you all, particularly Tess, who has come to lots of meetings with us and we're really indebted to your support for the preparation of the hearing. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioners. So, um, I'll ask uh, Commissioner Galvali whether you have any questions or any comment you wish to make to the uh, panel today. Look, I'd just like to start by thank you, thanking you very much. Um, it's a really, it's so important um, that this hearing um, has become so central to us. So thank you so much for all your effort. Um, the, I've got many questions, but, in, but there's so, so little time. Um, but I did want to ask about um, the national policy instruments um, on the topic of violence against women and girls and whether they include closed settings such as group homes, whether they're those mainstream policy um, 
whether they're including closed settings too, because tests, well, everyone really has identified them as being very important. So that's just one question. And, and whether you think it's possible to get that view in to them. Um, I'm happy. To... Yeah, you go. Um, well, obviously, uh, we are represented on the National Advisory yes. Group uh, to develop the new national plan to reduce violence against women and their children. And I would just like to say how hard we have worked. Um, uh, and it's not out yet. It's not. Um, uh, so, but, but um, I am very, very confident and hopeful that those uh, close settings and um, that you talk about will be in there. Um, certainly, we have fought very, very hard. Yeah. And um, can I ask just a quick one more? Um, and that's about um, the whole issue of sexual rights, especially. And the, it, I wonder whether you've got some thoughts about the, the greater um, risk to women and girls because sexual rights aren't part of the agreement in Australia because they're often denied. And somehow that puts women and girls at much greater risk, you know, the, and whether you've got any comment on that. So... Um, Commissioner, are you talking about in the context of the national policy frameworks? Um, just in general, that we've heard throughout this hearing and many other and other hearings, how sexual rights are almost often, you know, right on the back burner if they're at all, and then um, women and girls with disability um, become even more vulnerable because they're not addressed. And there's no attention given to that in terms of um, education, understanding, you know, anything to do with consent. Like everything's sort of almost like it's like a vacuum. And I just wondered about the connection of those two, you know, the denial of sexual rights for women and girls and then um, the, the much greater risk. Um, yes, that's a very good point. And I think when I referred uh, before uh, to CEDAW General Recommendation 35, published in 2017, it actually makes very explicit uh, around the sexual and reproductive rights violations, including um, denial of access to education, to information, to sexual and reproductive health services, um, as well as the things that I talked about, forced sterilisation, forced contraception, um, etc. Um, and it goes even further than that. It actually says that those can um, uh, actually amount to torture, uh, cruel, inhumane uh, punishment um, under certain circumstances. And so um, that's why I would be really hoping that the Commission would take, uh, take a really close look at that general recommendation because it does give a more holistic uh, definition conceptual framework around what constitutes gender-based violence. Um, and it does go to those things that you've just mentioned, Commissioner. Thank you. Probably. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Mason, do you have any comment or question? Unlike um, Commissioner Galbley, I do have a lot of questions, um, but we ran out of time. But um, what I what I am really pleased about is that WED has given um, really incredible quality evidence today, and that uh, First Nations um, leaders, particularly women, um, in the development of the national plan, um, in the work that is done with the women's alliances. Um, it really sets a scene for important conversations. So this is not about um, any, anything to do with any surprises. Um, WIDA has really laid out a very clear uh, clarion call for change. So um, I'll leave that there and I just want to say thank you and particularly to Tess um, for your leadership. Um, it's been really invaluable and um, timely. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Bennett, do you have any questions or comments? 
Um, I just want to say thank you as well. Um, and also I found your response to the paper in the 26 recommendations, and I'm glad that they're going to be available for others to see as well, because it's important to get that information out. And just building on Rhonda's, we've heard so many today, so many times today and yesterday, I think probably also from slightly older women than Marley, but about not knowing, not feeling they had rights um, in, in the sexual violence. Um, and hopefully that, that can, the reforms can be made so that um, that doesn't go on to another generation. And thank you. Thank you. Um, let me reiterate uh, what uh, Ms. Eastman has said and endorse her comments about the contribution you have made to the preparation for the hearing and uh, for this session. One of the things that is really been quite remarkable actually this week is the range of uh, issues that have been addressed within the framework of uh, uh, domestic family and sexual violence and uh, clearly the issues that have been addressed and the way that have been addressed uh, owe a great deal to the contribution that the wider has made to the organisation of the hearings and uh, that no doubt will be the subject of comment uh, later on as well but thank you very much for that and thank you very much for presenting your ideas so uh, forcefully and clearly today thank you thank you thank you chair um and thank you for everybody with a little extra time. As I said, we could probably spend a whole day in discussions, but our discussions will be ongoing. If we could have a short break, 15 to 20 minutes, and then uh, our evidence this afternoon will conclude with Nikita and the Yellow Ladybugs. Yes. Make a choice, Ms Eastman, 15 or 20? I'm going to take 20, because I think everybody here in Hobart Chair, we have had, um, we, we probably need a, a little cup of tea this afternoon, I think. So we'll take 20 minutes with your agreements. Thank you. With my benign agreement. Yes, all right. Well, we'll uh, come back at uh, 3.48 over time, <laughs> 2.48 Brisbane time. And no doubt uh, you'll take that into account in our last session. No uh, doubt I will. Right. Thank you. The Royal Commission is adjourned. someone. The Royal Commission is resumed. Yes, uh, Ms. Eastman. Thank you, Chair. We turn uh, now to the yellow ladybugs. You can see on the screen in yellow is Katie Coolis who is the founder and CEO of Yellow Ladybugs. Katie has uh, made her oath and affirmations before coming on screen, and so too has Nikita, and we'll hear from Nikita in a moment. So Katie, I've introduced you, and you're going to give us some um, opening remarks. Thank you. Just, sorry, just before you do, can I thank you for coming to the Royal Commission to give evidence. You're giving evidence from Melbourne, as I understand it. Is that right? Is that right? Yeah, correct. Okay. Just to let you know where everybody is, it may have been explained to you, but Commissioner Galbally is also in Melbourne, and you can see her on the screen. Commissioner Bennett and Commissioner Mason are in the Hobart hearing room, and they're waving enthusiastically to you. And I am in the uh, Sydney uh, hearing room, and I shall refrain from waving, mm. but uh, that tells us where we all are. So uh, thank you again for coming to the Royal Commission, and please proceed with your opening statement. Thank you, and I would like to thank the Disability Royal Commission for the opportunity to talk today on the experiences of autistic girls, women, and gender diverse individuals with a particular focus on family, domestic, and sexual violence. So thank you. So um, Mandela says, education is the most powerful weapon which we can use to change the world. And today I really do hope we can educate everyone listening through our stories. Stories that are sadly not particularly remarkable because they happen far too often. And by that, we hope we can start beginning to create change for our community. 
So Yellow Ladybugs is an autistic-led non-government charity with a strong mission to create opportunities for connection, learning and promotion of autistic pride for autistic girls, women and gender diverse individuals. We also have a really strong advocacy mission to address the many challenges, barriers and disadvantages we face, which is why today is so important. We are often the overlooked minority within the minority, within the minority. And we have so many cross intersectional layers of disadvantage, including LGBTQIA+, BIPOC, homelessness, poverty and violence. We are invisible as our disability is largely hidden. Being autistic and female gender diverse carries with it so many risks. A significant and known vulnerability for our community is being taken advantage of in relationships, often due to our own adaption of social skills, our often high ability to mask. It's sadly no surprise that as a result of this, we find our community is at much higher risk than the general population of experiencing abusive relationships. There are many complex layers to these stories and we are here today to give our community the voice and attention they deserve. Compounding this is living in a world not designed for us. We are the neuro minority. So often the expectation is that we must learn to fit in, change who we are, mask our identity, act normal. This societal expectation is often reinforced by the intensive compliance-based therapy some autistic children receive in their early years, which goes on to have such an impact on how they experience the world as adults. It is generally known as ABA. This is the type of therapy that emphasizes compliance. And in doing so, it reduces the ability of autistic people to trust themselves. Compliance training, akin to grooming, is a gateway to being manipulated by adults to do as they tell you without question. It is safe to say that there is no corner of this Royal Commission where the specific vulnerabilities of autistic girls, women and gender diverse individuals, or I guess it could be called our community, are not an important part of the conversation. But today we will talk about some of the protective measures we think will help reduce our community's vulnerability to experiencing such violence. So I think it might be worth spending a bit of time to revisit what Yellow Ladybugs means to our community and why we came about. Because by building a strong autistic network where we help each other better understand our identity, where we connect with our peers and we promote and develop pride, we believe that's an important area we need to focus on. We believe it's a shining example of a user-led organisation stepping up when the system has failed us for generations. And the importance of that system investing in user-led organisations such as Yellow Ladybugs. It is dangerous to be an autistic woman who does not have access to her community, who feels alone, misunderstood, shamed and not worthy. I want to share a quote that illustrates this point perfectly. He beat the shit out of me and nobody stopped him. I didn't report him to the police and I didn't take myself to hospital and I should have, but I didn't because that's all I thought I was worth. That's what happens when you soak one child in shame and give permission to another to hate. That quote is from Hannah Gadsby a Yellow Ladybugs ambassador and autistic woman. Worth, it's such a powerful word. So let me tell you a little bit more about the Yellow Ladybug story and how it connects to worth. I remember back to the first event we ever held. I created this event together with my six-year-old daughter just so she could meet other kids like her, girls who were autistic. They were hard to find. She'd already be been begun questioning her self-worth, feeling isolated and alone. And so she asked me to help her. Our first event, we had 20 autistic girls come along, some traveling as far as three hours away. That's how desperate they were to find their peers. And when I saw the parents watching their little ladybugs, all in their yellow t-shirts, wearing it with pride, playing and laughing together, 
I saw the parents have tears streaming down their face. I knew this was our calling. I knew we could make a real difference. And what I saw was the beginning of autistic pride, a beginning of belonging, a beginning of community, a safe place, an opportunity to educate against the many vulnerabilities and disadvantages they unfortunately most likely would face. And therefore I began to see the beginning of change. Since then, we have hosted thousands of ladybugs at events. We've evolved to online events so we can reach every corner of Australia. And in the process, we've uncovered the most difficult stories we've heard. Autistic women and autistic gender and diverse adults who have experienced such disadvantage. And this has helped us evolve our mission and widen our reach and our impact. We've also educated the very people that should already know, but doctors, teachers and professionals on what autism so often looks like in gender diverse and autistic females. We have provided a platform for education and we've amplified autistic voices. What this story doesn't highlight is how grossly unprepared the system is at recognising the diverse presentation of autism within our community. My family, as well as thousands more, have experienced a disproportionate number of barriers to getting a diagnosis for autistic females and gender diverse individuals. And this is important, and it does link to the risk of violence, because if you don't know who you are, you don't know how to protect yourself. Currently, there are no official consensus around the ratios, but I will say that one in four autism diagnoses in Australia is male to female, but a growing body of research and strong anecdotal evidence suggests the actual prevalence rates to be closer to one to one. In fact, a recent study pushed the ratio at four to three and notes that 80% of females remain undiagnosed at the age of 18. We have been overlooked for many reasons, including prevailing stereotypes of what autism looks like, the gender bias of standard diagnostic tools, and the way girls are socialized and viewed in our society. More generally, we know that many autistic females and girls and gender diverse individuals are missed or having their needs invalidated because of their hidden presentation. So why is this important? Well, the impact of this oversight extends beyond access to diagnosis and exposes so many layers to vulnerabilities, including economic disadvantage, inequality in healthcare, especially in the realm of mental health, restricted access to education and limited access to communities and their peers. Importantly for today, it exposes the specific vulnerabilities our community face in relation to violence in all its forms. There are so many more factors that contribute to our particular vulnerability. Grace Tain says, perpetrators typically target children with added vulnerabilities. These includes tenuous family circumstances, mental illness, self-esteem issues, prior trauma and isolation. In Grace's case, she was 15, anorexic, and we now know she was an undiagnosed autistic female. What we know from our community is that we find it difficult to identify when abuse is occurring. We may experience difficulty reading people's intentions. We have communication differences, which put us at a disadvantage. We have limited access to, to peers. So getting advice is hard. When reporting, it can be difficult for those of us with alexithemia as we struggle to identify how we are feeling. We may have executive functioning challenges, so the logistics of navigating an already difficult reporting system is overwhelming. One of our members says, I'm a 33-year-old autistic woman who has faced violence in many forms throughout my life. Going through the process, and getting involved in reporting was overwhelming for me. Even going to the police to report family violence is bad, let alone going to court, which is not a set up at all to support my needs as an autistic woman. As I've said today, Yellow Ladybugs is committed to changing the system. And, the and we decided to have a survey to better understand our community. And this, the responses confirm just how broken the system is and how autistic girls and gender diverse individuals are currently being failed. 
reading through the responses broke my heart. It made me sad, but it really did make me mad. We have to do better. So like I said, at the start of the year, we did put out a survey. We asked questions about domestic, family and sexual violence. The structure of the survey was a mix of qualitative and quantitative responses. I must admit, we didn't have a lot of time to promote it, but we did get 235 responses, which I th think shows how important this is to our community. I will not have a chance to go through all the observations today. I will table that in our report, which lays out a very bleak future for our community unless things change. Our survey results did confirm that all our community experience a particular set of vulnerabilities that put them at a risk of becoming victims of violence and abuse. We are typically undiagnosed and late diagnosed, as I said, as I said and have a lifetime experience of low self-esteem. And that's where we see people think there's something wrong with them. Seventy-five percent of our respondents have experienced physical violence. 76% of our survey respondents have experienced sexual violence. And 95% of our respondents with physical or sexual violence was from someone we knew, someone we trusted. We know these results are not alone and there's many more studies that paint a, a similar picture. In one overseas study, researchers found that autistic women had nearly three times the odds of having experienced sexual abuse compared to non-autistic women. While these statistics are shocking, it is the personal story shared by our survey respondents that deliver an even more powerful message. We have drawn on these stories in the recommendations we have developed. As you can see, autistic, this was one quote, autistic females need to be validated and recognized and supported to live an authentic, meaningful life. While our identity continues to not exist in the eyes of society, we continue to degrade and bury all of who we are. We become so empty and confused and traumatized that most of the time we don't even recognize if we are being mistreated by someone. Even if we do recognize the violence, we usually believe we're overacting because we've been told our entire lives to suck it up and stop being so sensitive. You can also see there's another quote on screen from another member, but there were so many ones similar to this. And that's what I mean about the overwhelming, consistent message that is coming across from our community. I'm going to finish up now um, this part of the conversation and head over to our case study. Thank you, Katie. It's um, Kate Eastman here. I think commissioners will now uh, ask Nikita. Nikita's prepared some words that she'd like to share with you. And um, you may not see Nikita on the screen, but you'll hear from her. So Nikita, when you're ready, there's no rush. When the man enters the room, the girl looks up with a curious smile, though if she knew his intentions, she would have run a country mile. He crosses the room, a strange look on his face, like a starved carnivore spotting some steak. It's true her short, short life had been far from ideal, but nothing could prepare her for the coming ordeal. The man snatches up the girl and stares at, tears at her clothes, hard hands bruising soft, untouched flesh. Insistent moist lips press into her face while stale breath and whiskey leave her senses a mess. Her cry of fear is cut off with a blow. The ground rushes up. She lets out a moan. In confusion, she looks up at the one she should trust, but all she could see was his treacherous lust. The tears of the innocent stay in the ground and her world becomes black as he covers her like a burial shroud. This is my earliest memory being sexually assaulted around age four. Luckily, I dissociated for most of it, a clever trick our brain does to allow us to survive the unthinkable. I completely shut down afterwards and when I was unable to tell anyone what happened. I do remember getting in trouble for destroying all of my dolls. The man had called me a pretty little doll and I knew they weren't safe, so I cut off all of their hair and drew all over them with black markers. 
My parents are good people, but they had no, no idea what to do with their strange first child. I met none of my mum's expectations of what a daughter should be. I remember, remember being punished for things that I didn't understand, being forced to wear clothes that set off all of my sensory, sensory sensitivities, being smacked in my sleep for grinding my teeth, being made to feel like whatever I did was not good, that I was never good enough, no matter what I, sorry, sorry. being made to feel like I was never good enough, no matter how hard I tried to make them happy. When I was around 10 years old, my dad's charismatic best friend assaulted me. He'd always been nice to me and gave me positive attention, something I severely lacked. So I thought nothing of it when he took me to the back of his property in the dead of night. There he raped me. After he finished with me, he made it very clear that it was all my fault and that my parents would be very upset at me if they ever found out what I did. I had no, no one to turn to, so I suffered in silence. When I was 13, I was groomed by my 30 year old sporting coach. I was very lonely at the time, didn't fit in at home and was bullied at school. He knew just how to take advantage of that. The relationship lasted until I was 17 and followed a typical narcissistic abuse cycle. The abuse I faced became more intense and degrading over time, but I struggled to leave and had no one to turn to for help. Unfortunately, stories like mine are all too common amongst the autistic community. It's no wonder that so-called high-functioning autistic women are 13 more times likely to commit suicide than the general population. Years of abuse, neglect, and having to mask constantly to be deemed socially acceptable takes a large toll. At the age 17 and a half, I finally broke away from my long-term abuser and went on to have a seemingly successful life to those on the outside. But the truth is, I've only had one other intimate relationship since that time, and that too was abusive. Other than that, I have emotionally separated myself from the world, all in the name of self-preservation. I bounce between perfectionistic overachieving to not being able to achieve the most basic of life skills. I trust no one apart from my children and my very patient therapist, or most of the time. I'm very good at what I do professionally, but I have faced discrimination and bullying in the workforce on numerous occasions. Currently, I work with a very good team that is completely accepting of me and my quirks, but often that is not the case. I have resorted to substance abuse and other unhealthy coping mechanisms throughout my teens and a lot of my adulthood. My past traumas affect my ability to be the mother I want for my wonderful children. They are awesome, but sometimes trigger my trauma responses, leading me to react in ways that they don't deserve. I'm currently working hard to heal from my past traumas and learn how to cope more healthily as an autistic adult in your typical world. It's a long, slow and often painful process, especially given my inability to trust people. I would like to think things have gotten better for people like me since I was a child, but I hear too many from too many of my autistic peers that are still being mistreated. Personally, I have had to fight every step of the way to get my own autistic children's needs met, particularly in the education system. In year seven, our public school repeatedly threatened to keep my daughter out of the academic extension program due to her inability to meet their minimum 90% attendance rule. This was despite her maintaining a B average, them knowing her diagnosis and us getting letters of support regarding her anxiety from multiple medical practitioners. At the end of the day, we managed to keep her in the program, but the process almost broke me. In the last month alone, I've heard too many stories that make me want to rage and weep. A friend whose autistic daughter is so overwhelmed by the system, she has resorted to giving herself third degree burns with aerosol spray. And despite that, her parents are still un unable to find adequate medical or psychological help for their child. Another child was left mute for days, suffering from sunburn and a heat stroke after being left in the, lying in the sun at school all day. They'd shut down after being screamed at by the EA employed to help them. Things must get better. Too many people are being hurt and neglected all for the crime of being neurodiverse. The string of letters I've accumulated after my name aren't the type that are admired by our society, but I'm still a person with rights, needs and dreams. Nikita Williams, ASD, ADHD, CPTSD, human being. Thank you. Nikita, thank you very much for sharing your poem sharing your experiences. 
we know this has been very difficult and we greatly appreciate you having the courage to share with us. Thank you. You've also got some recommendations that you want to make and the commissioners will have the opportunity to read the recommendations. Thank you, Nikita. And for anyone listening, I'll put up on the screen our content warnings and the telephone numbers. If anyone see, wishes to seek assistance or speak to somebody, the numbers are available on the screen. Thank you again, Nikita. Um, Katie, I think we're coming back to you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Nikita um, may stay on and listen in the background. So commissioners, you'll have an opportunity to thank both Katie and Nikita shortly. So Katie, as you know, uh, we've seen the results of the survey, which shows some quite startling statistics in relation to the experience of women and girls living with autism and their, what they report in the survey of both physical abuse, but also sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. The survey has been important in uh, the work that you do to advocate for uh, people living with autism, and particularly the experience of girls. Can I ask you about the importance of the advocacy work that you're doing? Do you want to talk about that topic now? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you so much for that. Yes, and thank you, Nikita, for sharing your story. It was, I'm very grateful um, to all the autistic individuals who have contributed to that submission, and it was very... Um, powerful so thank you the advocacy work we are doing covers the lifespan of our community and as we dig deeper it is getting more and more evident that it's generational trauma that we are seeing because of so many unmet need unmet needs amongst our community we have like I said earlier layers of vulnerability, but also a minority within a minority and a minority. And it's really taking the impact and it's formed some of the recommendations we have got for you today, which I'd like to talk to um, about this particular in inquiry. Do you, do you want to speak to those recommendations now? Yeah, I've got three recommendations I'd like to bring up and the rest we will table. Thank you. So the first recommendation um, we've got is that we do need to see a commitment to fund, develop and deliver a wide range of preventative education programs and resources for our community, specifically as a protective measure against our particular vulnerability to family, domestic and sexual violence. These programs need to be co-designed by the autistic community throughout every phase of their development and their delivery. And programs need to be covering topics such as safety, consent, healthy boundaries, re healthy relationships, coercive control, understanding the different types of abuse. And I do have one of our survey respondents that gave a quote on this topic saying, given we are vulnerable in the first place, preventative safety education is paramount. And given we are often not identified as children, it is important to offer this education to our community and make it autistic friendly. So more education and support, helping our community recognise toxic relationships, give them the support they need to leave toxic situations is critical. Our second recommendation, again, is preventative, but I know I spoke from the heart when I talked about yellow ladybugs and what it means um, to help us feel worthy and recognise our autistic identity, but we think that we need to fund peer support programs and events that enable social connections for autistic girls, women and gender diverse individuals. We identify this as a key protective measure, reducing their experiences of isolation and loneliness and the vulnerabilities to abuse that come with these experiences. And again, I've got another quote um, from one of our um, respondents saying, going to a Yellow Ladybugs event has been a lifesaver, literally. I did not want my daughter to experience the same lonely, isolated life I did as an autistic woman. 
She has developed friendships, a sense of pride in her autistic identity. And this is the biggest protective factor, I believe, which can cancel out all those vulnerabilities she may have experienced down the road. And the third recommendation um, we've got is further research combining lived and professional experience is needed to understand any link or risk between compliance-based autism therapies, including ABA, which can set autistic children up for a future of manipulation, exploitation, and abuse. And this is a quote from the Therapist Neurodiversity Collective. The purpose of pairing is for the ABA provider to associate, i.e. pair themselves with activities and objects that the child enjoys developing a relationship with them. The crucial difference between therapeutic rapport building and pairing is this. During pairing, the ABA provider uses their relationship with the child to later increase the child's willingness to comply with demands that they find aversive. Grooming and pairing are essentially one and the same. Both processes are intended to develop a relationship that an adult then leverages to encourage a formerly unwilling participant to do something that they may not have originally felt comfortable consenting to. So that is, I've taken from a third party source, um, but I do have another direct quote from an autistic woman who was a previous ABA therapist from, named inappropriate possum. ABA therapy has resulted in teens who comply with the demands of any authority figure. In short, we are allowing our children to mature into easy prey for predators by acquiring to their submission to a compliance reward structure that can be perverted and abused to harm them. We are so caught up in extinguishing behaviours in our offspring that we erase their ability to say no or defend themselves. This system of autism behavioural management doesn't teach recognising and avoiding predators, bullies and abusive people, and it has to change. So in conclusion, all the recommendations and protective measures in the world will not be effective unless society addresses the issue directly with the perpetrators. We are here today talking to the lived experience of autistic females and gender diverse people, but we cannot ignore that as Victoria's police has Police Assistant Commissioner Luke Cornelius has previously stated, violence against women is absolutely men's behaviour. So we need to shift the narrative away from the focus on victims and ensure this is a justice in a system that sadly has many times in the past served in favour of male perpetrators. But let me first, let me finish up by bringing it back to our ladybugs. We, and for those listening at home, we do not deserve to be invisible anymore. We do not deserve to be overlooked. We do not deserve to be ashamed of who we are. We do not deserve to be isolated. So we urge you to listen. We urge you to make real, substantial, practical changes. Our lives might just depend on it. Thank you so much for listening today and I'm available to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you, Katie. The commissioners may have some questions for you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I shall start uh, with uh, Commissioner Mason. Do you have any questions you would like to put to Katie or any comments? Um, no, I don't have any questions, but I'd like to thank you for the evidence that you've provided today, as well as Nikita. It's been uh, really excellent and um, wonderful that the voices of uh, women and girls has come through right through the evidence you gave today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioner Bennett, is there anything that you would like to ask? Um, I'd also like to say thank you, Katie, to you and Nikita, and particularly um, your ability to draw on your own experience and other women and girls and think about changes that need to be made and the suggestions that you've made to us. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, Commissioner Gelbert. Yes, I'd like to add my thanks to Katie and Nikita and ask a quick question about peer support and how incredibly valuable and important it is, but also as protection um, against risk 
and just wondered if you could expand on that. That was uh, that was really important, I think. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I we heard in some of the stories that with people talking about their experiences, isolation and not having peers to get advice from or just generally feel like you've got a community around you is powerful. But then on top of that, when you're in a, in a world that's not designed for you, um, you do feel like you're the outcast, you're the odd one out, and it affects your worthiness. And as we heard in Hannah Gatsby's quote, even if you are then in a position of being abused, you might not feel, feel worthy enough to report it. So having that ability to connect with people that understand you and are like you is incredible because you start beginning to build pride pride about who you are and know who your community is. We've seen it in other amazing um, revolutions such as the LGBTIQIA plus community. And this is where the autistic community is, is really starting to recognise how important it is that we unite and we connect with each other. And we know that we aren't the outcasts, we're just the minority. And when you provide that, that social connection, you are protecting the future generations, I mean, the current, but the future generations um, to empower them to know that they're worthy, to know that they're, they're different, they're not less. And this is what we need to do. We need to connect our community. And the fact is autistic, gender diverse and girls are particularly at risk of this because we're hidden and we're isolated and it's hard to find um, our peers. So this is why yellow ladybugs is so important because when I first found out my daughter was autistic, everywhere I went, it was just autistic males and boys. And this is the point. We're creating a world where now we're connecting it and there's demand globally, but we just can't keep up. There is just this need out there and we, we deserve it. We deserve to feel connected and that will protect us and very important. So thanks for the question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Katie, and thank you also to Makita, for, uh, to both of you, for the thought and care you put into your presentation. Uh, we know it's uh, not necessarily easy to do that in an environment such as this, and uh, we very much appreciate uh, your contributions to the hearing this week. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ms Eastman, does that mean we adjourn until tomorrow at 10 a.m.? Uh, I just want to tender some material from Libby Crawford's evidence and the Nikki case study. So if I can attend to that and then we can adjourn until 10 o'clock tomorrow. Yes. So could you take into evidence the video recording of Elizabeth Crawford? and also the transcript of the video recording with Elizabeth Crawford and mark those two items exhibit 17.26.1 and 17.26.2. Yes, that can be done. The video recording and the transcript of the video recording of Elizabeth Crawford will be admitted into evidence and they will be given the margins indicated by the system. Then in terms of what we'll describe as the Nikki case study, could you receive into evidence the following items? The video recording of Nikki and Nikki's mum and the transcript of the video recording of Nikki and Nikki's mum and mark those items exhibit 17.27.1 and 17.27.2. Yes, uh, the video recording and the transcript of the video recording of uh, Nikki and Nikki's mum will be admitted into evidence and given those markings. Then um, the statement of Caroline Cumming, dated the 18th of February 2022, if you could receive that statement into evidence and mark it 17.28.1. Yes, the statement of Ms Cumming will be admitted into evidence and given the marking of 17.28. Uh, 28.1. And uh, Chair, there are some additional documents with respect to the Nikki case study, as the commissioners and parties with leave to appear will be aware of uh, tender bundle D. 
we, what we propose to do in the directions that the commissioners will make tomorrow is to make provision for discussions to occur about what additional documents need to be tendered following the oral evidence today. So it's just Ms Cummings' statement at the present time, and then we can deal with the balance of the tenders at a later date, if that's convenient to the commissioners. Yes, thank you very much. And that uh, perhaps can include consideration of whether the uh, report that was referred to in evidence from 2020 might be included in the bundle because apparently it's not presently in the bundle. So I think I said tender bundle D, but I meant to say tender bundle B. So I apologise for that. Transcript can be corrected accordingly. Um, commissioners, that concludes the evidence for today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you again to uh, all of the witnesses who have given evidence uh, today. We'll resume at uh, 10 o'clock uh, tomorrow, Hobart uh, time and uh, 9 o'clock uh, Brisbane time. Thank you very much. The Royal Commission is adjourned.